All right, there will be bourbon tonight being fueled, as always, by America's native spirit. We've got a little Castle and Key batch two. This is uh, something that they, they, so it was, so originally this was the old Taylor Distillery. Uh, it's in Frankfort, Kentucky, which is home to a lot of famous distilleries. But this one's been abandoned. Anyway, these uh, these guys went in there. They 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 bought it up, I think, in 2015 and re refurbished everything and, and kind of brought or are bringing new stuff to the market now. And this is one of those. Uh, like I said, it is batch two. It's bottle 1979. It's four years old. It's pretty tasty. It's, you know, like I said, it's something I've been looking forward to. It's a 99 proofer. Uh, the bottle itself is pretty ornate. It's one of the best looking bottles I think you can find. It's very unique. Uh, it says Castle and Key on it like seven different times. So they're definitely making sure you know what it is. So maybe red, when you make the next murder cult shirt, you could put the logo like seven different times all over. There we go. Yeah. But anyway, so that's what I'll be drinking. Uh, I don't know what my good man over here is. Are you imbibing? Are you, are you keeping it sober tonight? No, I'm actually hitting a little bit of horse soldier right now. Oh, there we go. Which one? uh man what is it like all i have right now in front of me is the glass let me give me give me two okay. seconds i'll, I'll check i'll check the bottle yeah we've had we've had a little horse soldier on here before that's good stuff brink actually before he gave it up that was one of his uh, i believe that was one of his favorites i know he's the one that got me to try it um so for those that are listening, as I, before I introduce him, so you will notice that it's just me on here. Um, we will have the audio up that obviously you don't see people talking on. But anyway, so that, that's why he is there. He keeps his uh, anonymity for obvious reasons that we'll get into. Um, All right. So I'm, I'm hitting the uh, their small batch right now. Okay. I small batch is solid. That, I, I honestly think that's their best one. There's a barrel proof and I think a single barrel. But um, yeah, the small batch is delicious. I yeah, it is. I've got a couple bottles of them. Uh, one of them was a gift and like every now and again, I'll crack it open and take a big, take a big pull. So yeah, so horse soldier is really good with that. Like, I, I don't know if they're still doing it, but I know at least originally the bottles were, they were using what pieces from the world trade center. Like the so, so I think what it was, was the, the stamping mechanism yeah. or the metal was actually made out of the towers. And so every one of these pieces of metal basically ended up touching the towers in some way, shape or form. So exactly. it's cool. I mean, it's one of those things where like, you know, after you kill that bottle, you end up kind of keeping it around because yeah, it's got like, some nice yeah. <laughs> decoration to it. All right. Which it is a cool story. And um, yeah, like the stuff that's actually in there, I'm pretty sure it's still sourced from MGP, but it's, it's really good. They, they get a really good product in there. But anyway, all right. So this is, uh, so one of my favorite accounts, a lot of people's favorite accounts on Twitter, he's, he's grown to a, a pretty large profile now, which is good. You know, I think it's pretty cool that a lot of our, you know, some of the people we, we, we touch elbows with or roll with have grown their accounts fairly large. Yours happens to be one of them. So it is what snake eater 36. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. On Twitter. Uh, he's also the co-founder of this beautiful shirt that I'm wearing. Uh, well, it's not the shirt, it's the company. Murder Cult, which we're going to learn a little bit more about. Um, and then, yeah, as you see his name on the screen, if you are watching the YouTube, it is Red Devil on Twitter. So big, uh, what is it, like an SF background, obviously, yep. right? Special Forces background. He's also uh, pretty well <laughs> versed in, I think, we three of your favorite letters would be CQB at this moment, right? Uh, I wouldn't say I'm well versed, but it's been a, it's there's been some interesting arguments online about it, and it's it's forced me to kind of open up a toolkit, so to speak, in terms yeah. of arguments when it comes to that. Yeah, which is pretty cool. So I I will I think it'd be valuable information for a lot of people to hear because it, it, unfortunately some of these things have found their way into the the news lately. Uh, oh, yeah. Not for not for good reasons. All right. Uh, but first, let's start with the murder cult thing. Right. What is that? How did that come about? So, uh, man. So Grunt Pa, uh, another kind of mutual yeah. follower, who was, who was a, yeah. Oh, nice. He was a, a, a infantryman in the 82nd. He and I actually do a lot of shooting competitions together, and he's probably one of the like of the kind of the crew of Twitter people I kind of run around with. He and right. I usually hang out in person uh, the most frequently, and um, he was getting heckled by some weirdo on Twitter that I think was running for office in Georgia or whatever was talking about, you know, how the military, he, and this guy that was, that was uh, heckling grunt had also served in the Marine Corps and was, uh, you know, basically saying that the military is nothing more than a murder cult and that like, you know, he'd never join it or whatever. And then it turns out he works for like some contracting company that 
develops and builds night vision or some sort of a camera devices that the military like specifically subcontracts for. Nonetheless, I saw that and I was like, man, that's a really cool name. I wonder if I can steal that. And so, um, uh, another buddy of mine, uh, Brink of Ill, who's also on Twitter, right, yeah. uh, we were kind of shooting the shit. And I'm like, man, I, you know, I'm kind of interested in doing a t-shirt company. Do you have any connections? And he did. So we ended up kind of starting, you know, starting every st- everything. Uh, we made an LLC for it. And then we're like, fuck it, let's make a t-shirt. Uh, and so we made this t-shirt with the idea that like, because there's a lot of veteran companies that make t-shirts and i what i didn't want to do is like overly vet it out and so i the one thing i didn't want to do is like have anything like specifically military on the shirt like i posted some pictures from my deployment in africa there just because i thought it would be kind of cool and i'm a fan of kind of the 80s techno vibe and so i yeah i kind of edited that right there's i and i actually i still need to make a uh 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 playlist on spotify but i got that and i was like you know i like hp lovecraft i think the cthulhu head is a really cool design uh so why not talk to another buddy to see if he's interested in doing some of our artwork and so we put all that together and what i wanted to do was like not make it this like overly like how do i put it like murder cult obviously kind of has like this kind of weird name to it where like if you wear it on a (laughs) you wear it on a shirt people like oh that's kind of weird but i did want like initials and i thought the mvcv would be kind of cool to do too and so like we played with this idea for probably about man it would have been three or four months that we were trying to hype it up before the shirt came out and then when it finally came out i think the design came out well it was like kind of this 1980s you know rocker stylization for the lettering the the cthulhu head came out really well too and uh i you know like i all I want to do is make a shirt where if I was in a, in an, in a uh, airport somewhere and I saw somebody wearing it, like that's all I'd really care about. You know, I did. Yeah. That's all I want to do is, you know, make cool stuff for my bros. Yeah. So we did that. And then um, we're looking at, I think doing a t-shirt and patches next. I actually just got an email about that today. And then um, we've kind of played with the ideas of doing like Ranger panties and then like another t-shirt uh with like a tropical tropical um like tiger stripe eyes that will like yeah. okay. you know will turn green when you sweat or whatever so there's been some some interesting designs and stuff so yeah we've when we've the, got when's the murder cult rifle come out oh man i don't know i don't know i don't know i you know i've i've thought about it and it i i don't know if i could bring myself to do it quite yet um only because all it would be is like branding and so yeah. Yeah. You know, like if I if I did it, it'd just be a lower that just has MVCV etched on it. And while that is really cool, like if I was gonna throw my hat in a ring somewhere, like I'd wanna, I think you I would want more. Yeah, I'd want yeah. more control than I think I'd be given to anybody who would subcontract. So I'm kind of playing. Yeah, you know, I've talked to some folks about it, and I think etching it would be kind of cool. But I really haven't played with it too much, and you know, that it's. It's it's a it's a big uh, can of worms to open when you go into like firearm the firearm yeah, business. Yeah, no, I, I, like I, I think I'm going to crack open that can a little further in a bit. But for, let me let me come back to yeah. So the logo, what made you guys go with the to get rid of the U and go with the V, like kind of old school? Like I liked the I actually yeah. liked the lettering. Um, and I forget where I had seen I'd seen it before. Um, That's but I just like. Yeah, I mean, like, it's like kind of that very, like, um, you know, that Roman or Greek U. Right, right. And uh, I just, like, I didn't want an M-U-C-U because it looked, it just looked too weird in terms of, like, design. And so the the MV just kind of had kind of a sharper, cleaner look to it. And honestly, it was just a matter of aesthetics. And then when it came out, it was like, oh, man, like, you can, you know, you're able to refer to this you know this organization or brand or whatever is mvcv instead of like not having to say murder cult all the time <laughs> it, it, it is a good it's a good conversation starter i've had yeah. a few, i've had a few uh i think i think i sent you guys a picture when i first got it i went down to the like every saturday i go down to the nap the farmer's market and i wore it down there that day and it, it was kind of funny like it's, right yeah it's like it definitely this turns is... heads and i think i said it i don't know if i said it to you guys or i said it to somebody else when they asked, they're like, who's Murder Cult? I'm like, oh, they're this great 80s cover band. You should check them out. <laughs> just, just, just to see what people say. It's just funny because <laughs> like, it, it does catch the eye. And you're uh, like, what is that? 
Yeah. And then depending where you're at, obviously you're going to get different reactions, of course. Right. So you know yeah. where I'm at. So that's a good time out here. Um, so did you guys send the guy a shirt by chance and, and thank him for his, his service and helping you guys create that name? No, we should though. <laughs> you really should. It'd be we funny. really should. That would be kind of funny. Be like, thanks, bro. Hey thanks man, for thanks. Your, appreciate thanks it. Thanks for your idea. So I probably ought to do that. Yeah. So I'll send him some stickers. I don't know if he warrants a t-shirt, but I got plenty of stickers. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty cool, though, man. It, it, I think it's a good idea. And like I said, I know I, I kind of jokingly said it, but I did want to because I you you do you put a lot of gun content out, right? Yeah. And I think it's it's important to understand the stuff because, like me, I I know what the only thing I know about weapons and rifles is because I've been in the army for fucking 20 years at this point that's what i know but I, I do not pretend to have any bit of knowledge more than what i need to know for you know basic rifle marksmanship and some advanced stuff and that's about it the cqb and all those things that's it's very remedial is my understanding of things so i don't pretend to know what i don't know um when what is your biggest issue with how let's go with an ar-15 for example what's your biggest issue with how that is portrayed in the media to the public especially today you're talking about just the rifle itself or yeah like... just in general like what is the misconception and why is it so demonized and like knowing what you know about the rifle itself or the platform itself what do you think people are getting uh what are they misunderstanding about well it? i think generally like this whole like you know you don't need a weapon of war thing is kind of the initial like it's like this initial stake that people drive for some sort of strange like emotional argument right like mm -hmm. literally everything like you, i mean we can kind of get hit we kind of get stupid with it but it's like everything's a fucking weapon of war like you can yeah. pretty much use any implement that you would use to kill anybody as a weapon of war and mm -hmm. since the firearm has been invented every firearm you know can be or it has been used in some form or fashion as a weapon of war right like mm -hmm. if we're just looking at gas blowback guns Every gas, gas. I mean, every every gun is pretty is either a gas blowback gun or a piston gun, right? And they've all been used as weapons of war, revolvers, pistols, etc. Right? So like this, like it's the same argument of like what an assault rifle is. It's just like this semantic conversation that people have to make themselves selves feel better about, you know saying that an ar is a weapon of war and it's like it shoots the same round as a you know uh, a, a ranch rifle um that looks just like you know your granddad's wooden stock yeah. rifle there's nothing in particular about it that like makes it any more deadly like i've watched some of the i've watched you know politicians argue that like a pistol grip and a folding sock make it easier to conceal or like easier to engage targets with and it's like none of that has any real bearing when it comes to actually um you know like committing a crime or shooting anything like you're not like nobody's going to choose a rifle with a pistol grip uh in terms of availability over a, a one with a wooden stock like nobody's going to push away a gun with a wooden stock and be like no nah, man i'm gonna wait four months for the one with the pistol grip like <laughs> at the end of the day like people are going to perpetrate crimes with right. what's available to them um you know like rifle ars are, are available because they're uh, mass produced but that's that's like making that an argument for more gun control is like saying that, you know, more drunk drivers get into car wrecks with Toyota Corollas. So we should limit the amount of Toyota Corollas that exist. Like it's just, it's silly. Um, you know, and so like any time the argument gets kind of gets shut down about uh, firearms, they just, people just argue that something else needs to happen, right? Limit yeah. the amount of 30 round magazines or, um, you know, California has weird, weird, like laws when it comes oh, to, yeah. you remember I sent you guys those clips from like, yeah. like a year and a half ago and we yeah. drove, we had, with the, and you're like, what the fuck is that? And it's got like a weird <laughs> grip, right? Or yeah, you, you can't, can't wrap, you literally puzzle. can't wrap your hands around it in the pistol grip. Like you have, oh, yeah. it's, it was, it, it is weird. But, and the weird thing is, is it's like you, we legislation continues to try and uh, out legislate innovation and it's just not possible. Like now that we've 3D printed right. um, rifles and pistols, like the ability to try and legislate anything is just not going to happen. Um, in addition to that, like if we really took any of what we were doing seriously, like we wouldn't even be having a conversation about the tool. We'd be having a conversation about, you know, 50 other things, right? Like how are, how are 
you know, people were paying money for in terms of our security professionals actually treating locations. Um, you know, what, what's, what's the deal with mental health? There's about 50 other things we could, uh, you know, broach and have serious changes where I think you could have a bipartisan conversation as opposed to just like looking at an AR-15 and being like, oh, this is definitely the problem. But that's what's weird about that, though, is like that's why I said I brought that up originally and introduced it into the, the topic of conversation is because that's what everyone sees like, oh, my God, this rifle. But we act like that's the only gun available in America. Yeah, right. You get it. You get, I mean, you, you get AKs. It's it's only it's only available because of its uh, pr- prolific nature. Right. Yeah. So like it is a very prolific rifle. But that's, you know, I mean, the reason why people are, you know, it's it's like if anything was more readily available. Uh, then that would be the choice of whatever, right? If all, if, you know, for some reason there was a significant amount of one type of alcohol, then it's like, well, fuck it. Everybody's going to drink that. Right. Like it's not a, I don't know. It's just weird. It's weird that people argue and it's like, well, of course it's the AR because it's the easiest rifle to get a hold of. You're not going to pay, you know, massive over the shelf prices for an AR when you're looking for a nicer AK or whatever. Plus like, you know, you could buy almost anything off of, I, I don't want to say you can buy almost anything off the internet. You could buy ARs ease more easily off the internet, knowing that they're going to work than like an AK or something else. So, so you, you, yeah, you bring that up. So is is this like is this pushing more people towards AKs now? Is that because they they seem to be out of the the target of you know that's bad. I have you know I really haven't seen anything, and I honestly yeah. don't think anything's going to come from the legislation with with ARs. I think uh, I think realistically it'll there will be more state pressure that gets put on it um i but i really just don't see anything coming out of i think this is going to be more lip service to anti-gun organizations uh and democrats are going to say we tried and republicans are going to you know basically stick their heels in the dirt and it's not going to go anywhere and then everybody's going to be pointing fingers like they did you know the last time this happened well that's what i think is funny about like you bring up the states like i can remember at least within the last i guess probably six or seven. I'm trying to remember when the San Bernardino one was. And then you remember that, that Navy dude that went on that fucking, or that former, yeah. Navy, that, like Chris something, I think his name was like, he went out on that big, like, and then just recently in Sacramento, a couple months ago, there was one with a, an AR. And, like, it's not stopping this stuff. No. And it's not, it, it won't stop. I mean, if you have access to any, anything you have access to, you're going to use, right? And so mm-hmm. it's like the minute you start legislating rifles, then handguns are going to be, you know, the, the more prolific tool right. for committing a crime. And so it's like all you're doing is just, you know, shifting your tool of choice. And yeah. any like the funny part is like, you know, they'll make anybody will make any argument that's against it to stop it, right? Oh, the bullets are terrible. They liquefy, you know, guts or whatever. And it's like, it's, it's, they don't. The stuff that's uh, been they going certainly... on in Congress has been hilarious. The testimony, like about the bullets, like oh, that they they liquefy organs and they they make the the head dis- disappears nearly from a from a from a, a five point five six round. Really? Oh, did I lose red? I think we lost red. No, no, I got you. Oh, it's, there he uh... is. I'm just I'm just closing as many windows and turning my. <laughs> you hear that? He's closing windows, folks. Very very important guy. It's awesome. <laughs> Sorry. No no worries, man. Yeah, but I think that's what's funny going on. With, like they just had this doctor. I can't remember her name. That was up there trying to talk about how like uh, uh the bullet is so much more deadly than you know the thirty out six or whatever whatever thing that she could compare it to, and and is trying to say that it was like liquefying the the organs and making heads basically disappear and they're not there after they get shot oh yeah well and that's what's funny too is it's like you look at a 308 or 556 and like the ballistics for rifle rounds do vary right uh the biggest leap in terms of like wound cavity and stuff you'll get is from pistol to rifle and it's just because the speed at which rifle rounds move stretches tissue in their you know to their limits and margins and then actually you know does like significantly more permanent damage right. and so the fact that they're arguing what rifle is worse than the other rifle or what rifle round is worse than another round it's like bro like any rifle round is going to do significantly more damage than a pistol yeah. um but i mean a 30 out six round and a 762 round coming out of a you know a 16 inch barrel is going to jack you up too and it's like 
I don't know. It's just really funny that this, you know, the the arguments that they continue to make are like these old FUD arguments of like, well, the bullet tumbles and it does all this damage. And it's like, all right, well, so talk to me about all these really fast bullets in Mogadishu that were ripping through people and dudes were still, you know, yeah. fighting Delta Force and Rangers <laughs> with all this. It's just it. There, it's a it's a convenient argument uh, to feel good about uh, bad legislation, which really, which is all it really comes down to. And then you know, I mean, I really don't want to because I think we've seen. Because let's not pretend that all Democrats are against guns, right? They're not. And not all Republicans are for them, as we've seen, right? I think it comes down to people in individual states and their state's culture. And that's what's kind of like really gotten weird out here in California is because I've said this multiple times in our chat, or I think a lot of you guys may even have experience maybe. Um, you know, you come up to Northern California, and there's plenty of parts in Southern California, but you come up into Northern California, once you get past the Bay Area and all, you get up into the like Humboldt County and the Eureka and Redding and you get into those hills like these people don't fuck around. It's like, right? like um, upstate New York, parts of upstate New yes, York, too. Like the minute absolutely. you get out of Manhattan and you get into the hills, it's like, oh, this is New York. But it's like not the New York everybody envisions. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's another so world. It's, yeah, it really it really is. And, um, you know, so it is it is interesting to see that. And I think I mean, everybody says it. it, it, it first of all, it, it's an education thing and if pe yeah. if guns aren't your thing then that's fine and like obviously yeah. there's plenty of politicians where like guns aren't their thing but the amount of information that gets pushed out too it's not like you know we can have a debate forever in terms of um abortion and what we consider a life etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, but when, when it comes to you know the lethality of a rifle or the use of a rifle or whatever it gets pretty um objective right it's like you know you can you can argue, um, you know, you can argue ballistics and you can argue whatever you want. And when it comes down to it at the end of the day, like, you know, there's not a rifle, you know, there's not, there's no such thing as the 30 caliber clip. Right. And so it's like they, there's, there is a certain amount of subjectivity and a lot of arguments that politicians make and that, and that comes from like their background. But when it comes to, you know, educating or arguing for or against a firearm, it just seems like, um fucking magic right and it's like oh this yeah. thing can you know this is basically an m2 bullet hose and all it does is just it's like specifically targeted at killing as many people as possible and it's like well it is a gun yeah well, and, and so, <laughs> like, i mean i see this, what i think i i, I forgot to, to complete the thought was i i was making the, the the point about you know democrats and republicans and not all of them are but we peel that back even further it's supposed to be a representation, right? That's why they're there. But we get so many, it's not just guns, it's it's so many other bills, right? Where so many other things that get brought up where it's all like it's either a party line vote or it's just a, oh, whatever letters next to my name, that's what I gotta vote, rather than voting what your actual constituents want. Like that's what I feel like we've gotten away of we've gotten away from with our politicians the most. And that's why I think there's so many other issues that tie into all the other things that we argue and kind of claw and fight over. But if you take it to just the gun level, I think if you if 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 representatives were actually voting based on how their actual constituents wanted, I don't think we'd have as a lot of the issues that we do, especially when it comes to guns. Because oh yeah, well, in in this like vote blue, no matter who. Like I think I saw it the other day mm -hmm. on Twitter, and it's like there's this like yeah, I've seen that. There's definitely a pervasive tribalism in this. Like mm -hmm. every time I see uh kind of like the vote blue no matter who or like vote, you know if you tow a party line even though you disagree with this person because you're trying to prohibit you know some larger push you think is going to occur all it does is just extends the sw sweep of the political pendulum against your favor eventually and it's just like yeah you know i i don't know the fix to it but it is it, it, it is a little bit weird to see because it's not even like a like a we're not even trying to balance the conversation isn't like we're not even trying to balance e e representation we're literally just trying to reap vengeance on the other side politically to sh to to like illustrate our hurt from the last thing that got done so like this roe v wade thing like whenever there becomes this you know control or you know like whatever ends up occurring to counter it is going to be no nothing more than done out of spite and not to like provide some sort of equal stance on you know like a counter argument to it so that's all i've been seeing so this ar-15 thing is it's going to be interesting but i really don't think anything's going to come out of it
Yeah. It, it, what's, what's also kind of funny. I don't know if, I mean, I'm a, I'm a few years older than you, but I don't know if you remember kind of like the movies in the eighties. And I think maybe probably it kind of topped out at like very, very early nineties, but definitely like mid to late eighties. It was all about the sawed off shotgun. Oh yeah. Like, like you know, that Terminator was like, to, yeah. Terminator, yeah, Terminator I mean, and Dirty Harry, all these things. It was like the big fucking powerful revolver or handgun and then the sawed off shotgun like that was yeah. it was all about concealment and you know that was how you could it was super powerful which you know what now that i have you on here because i had i was asked this question the other night and i couldn't remember like why but why does is, is a is a sawed off shotgun that much more powerful than you just left the barrel on no ironically enough sawed off shotguns are probably less powerful Really? Okay. And then a full size because uh, it's like a it's like a short barreled rifle, right? Right. So six, like let's say you have a sixteen inch rifle versus like a ten inch rifle, or mm -hmm. you've got a full length shotgun versus a shorter shotgun. Typically, you have less powder burn in a rifle, so you're going to have a lot of like unburnt powder in your rifle. I don't think it's really much different in a shotgun. Plus, like the shotgun's barrel, even without a choke, is still going to direct your shot a little bit into like a like a cone. Uh, yeah. But if on a short barrel, right on a short barrel shotgun, you're basically letting these things go, you know, four inches out of the barrel and they're just going to fucking go everywhere. So the only value they really have is like if you're really close to somebody or a truck yeah. gun or whatever. So, I mean, that, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, it's a pirate gun. I mean, yeah. if you if you want to slug, bus. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's exactly what it is. Right. It's just a modern blunderbuss. So, I mean, they're cool for blowing doors open. And that's that was really the origin for a lot of people was like you know they were it was portable you could easily conceal it and then for the military like the military only uses shotguns for opening doors yeah, like, it's like you know the mps yeah people. they just carry shotguns and yeah that's all that's all we ever use it for and we don't even load it with bird shot or you know buck shot it's all um it's all uh what is it it's uh not fiberglass it's like zinc and something else and it basically really? just like sh yeah it shreds uh um, I can't, and I see like it, it's where I was around the tip of my tongue for a minute, but it's, it's graphite. All it is, is just graphite, graphite okay. and it blows graphite into the locking mechanism and, you know, basically shreds metal and gets thrown out. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's see, this is, this is why he's here to give us all kinds of, uh, a level of trivia that I can't provide. That's good though. Yeah. I don't know if I'd want to get shot with that. No, there's a few <laughs> guys that have had accidents with it, uh, in like the late or sorry, the, the early two two thousands one dude got uh, popped in the leg and it shredded his leg up pretty bad. I mean, and then you get graphite in your legs, like you're going to have to get that stuff pulled out and you'll have some uh, pretty wicked infection. So it definitely doesn't feel good. It's probably better than getting hit by like, you know, buck or slug, bird shop. Right? Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Or like a slug, <laughs> but you know, it's not super awesome. Yeah. Hat and rounds. That's what they're called. Hat and rounds. Hat and rounds. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. It sounds like, <laughs> I mean, like having a moment. <laughs> yeah. It sucks to be the door, I guess, you know, it really. does. <laughs> it really does. All right. So now, um, let me, let me just, I mean, let me, I know this is going to be kind of a, it's, it's a shitty topic, but it is, it's the reason why it's in the fucking, the, the news cycle. Right. So this, the thing in Uvalde. Yeah. I'm saying that right. I mean, I know we all had initial reactions and I think this might be the first time that I can remember in a very, very long time that I think initial reactions weren't as strong as they are after all the facts have come out. If that makes sense. Like, I think yeah. like, the more that comes out, the worse we're reacting. Like we're getting more and more upset rather than, oh, well, I guess that makes sense. Right. We're not even saying that we're just getting more and more pissed off for lack of a better term i think honestly the clear the closest correlation is probably parkland and we were super pissed at the cops in parkland but i think the response got there fast enough to the point where it was like okay i, I don't want to say it was acceptable but yeah. it was you know we in parkland it was it was viewed as it was only one guy and it looks like in uvalde it was like the entire police department which <laughs> which is bad which is really bad so what you so you've seen that have you seen all the video that they've posted now i guess yeah like, and i i mean and my things. sorry my outrage oh, and my opinion ha has not really wavered or changed there were okay. some people that had dm me and told me to wait 
there's some fellow SF dudes that were, um, you know, that felt like in that circumstance, the police may have had some other issues that caused them not to do it. And so they wanted to wait. And um, I know, man, I just had a sneaking suspicion. Everything was kind of fucked up because nothing really made sense to me. And, um, you know, I, it's just, it was once once the Bortak guy, once they released to the, you know, that the Bortak guy had done it, um, and then they kind of gave a little bit of clarification on that. It was just kind of like, yeah, this is, it's an absolute nightmare. So I, I watched um, the video and then I watched um, a few, you know, play by plays that some SF dudes had done on YouTube. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it had, my opinion on it has not really changed at all. So uh, you said a few things. So what, what was, you said some SF dude said there was some stuff that might have prevented. Like, what do you mean by that? What they were they were basically saying, you know, the their um, I think his argument was that uh, Uvalde PD did not have the necessary equipment, that the door was locked. So this was all pre before the video investigation findings, right? And so um, it, it was a lot of word of mouth stuff that I think he'd been told, and so he's like, you know. You, it's kind of hard to breach door with, you know, without any tools. He didn't think they had Halligan tools. And so, it, you know, I think the argument he made was these guys were undergunned, undermanned and underprepared. And so that's what took so long. And then that was kind of why Bortak had done it. And then once the video got released, it was like, oh, no, this is this is a shit show. OK, and then that's the second thing. So, yeah, everyone we all were like initially. So this goes back to. So I had Grunt last well about two weeks ago now and then about two weeks before that was damp and we were talking about it because this was pretty fresh in our minds did the bortak dude actually do this or was that just kind of like you know the ghost of kev with fucking shooting six migs down and all this because i don't see like in the video where that guy even came from so there's i think in the video you don't see them in that hallway so the okay. most of the video is just in that specific hallway and then as it's so i watched a narrated one and as those guys did the breach, you saw uh, some of the Bortac guys go in, not go in. You saw them basically stacked up on the door and then they, they breach and, or they, you know, they basically open it, enter it and okay. then en engage him. So the, you may, like you may have seen, cause there's some dudes in plain clothes that do walk down that hallway. So he may have been one of them, but they, I want to say they also entered at a different location um in that school than like where the main t intersection hallway is where you see kind of all the cops just chilling out with their shields and stuff yeah so i, I think that's the thing though because like the way i think it came out like very early on like you know we we, we saw the picture of you know he took a fucking grazed round on his head or something mm -hmm. i think everyone assumption was that guy just ran in there and just took care of it himself no, one no i want to say it was happen. like a four-man bortac team okay. but i want but i i'm assuming uh he was probably the number one or number two man when they went in so it was a team of four or five guys as i'm meant <laughs> recollecting yeah and then he was the one that basically got shot at and and from what i understand they also found this kid in like a fucking closet like he wasn't just barricaded behind a uh he was trying to maximize whoever came in after him he was going to try and do more right yeah. so um and i think that's when that board tech agent got hit and initially it was like oh yeah this dude basically just went in there and soloed this kid with a handgun when it was really you know four yeah. other team members but it was board tech that went in there because i want to say another one of the team members got a shotgun from his barber and went with him and basically ran in there with you know that's pretty fucking cool a, a, a hey, barber i need my shotgun <laughs> hey, get, they were i think they were all like getting their haircut or something they're like oh shit something's going down and it's like all right guns up let's go so yeah, that was. So you said um, because there, there's a few things I want to talk about here because this is what I really wanted to get your your take yeah. on. So the first thing would be you said your opinion hasn't really changed much since the initial. Mm -mm. So what was your initial reaction to it then? Oh man, so it's basically uh, the some the minute that kid the minute shooting started and bodies were. Uh, piling up somebody whether it was one person or four people or 10 people should have rushed that door and uh put themselves in between the assailant yep. and the the kids or the teachers or whatever like they're really it that that should not ha have lasted longer than the amount of time it took for police to be on site um 
the fact that there are multiple police officers and levels of police officers, uh, you know, with like, let's just say they're not wearing armor. Those guys maybe have a reason to argue that they don't want to go in there. Uh, but I would still call them cowards because that's their job. If you yeah. once, once like 10 minutes in or however long in that they had, you know, they like, you, like they basically just progressively got more stuff and they became more cowardly. And so it was like, oh, now we've got rifles and we've got plates. Yeah. Like there we're was not going to no do for, anything. There was no force multiplication, right? It was just, no, yeah. or there was force multiplication, but there was no projection. Yeah. And so, you know, the more these dudes got stuff, the, you know, the, the, there was no movement in terms of, you know, them ex prosecuting that target. Um, and so, you, you know, you see it every time you, you every time I see that it just, it's so infuriating because you look at a lot of, uh, you know, and basically in an organization that even trains CQB or trains room clearing, your tools are literally handgun rifle, ballistic helmet and plate carrier mm -hmm. and these guys that started getting ballistic shields like they yeah. had everything they needed in order to stop the violence that was occurring um and it, there was just this like you know cowardice or whatever it was that influenced these you know grown men to stop the to not stop these children from being killed uh it, it was it was prevalent there and it was just like it's one of those things where it's like ha ha it's it's almost beyond frustrating and it's like this this really shouldn't have happened like this shouldn't have even been a thing and i think that's where i think a lot of people can kind of coalesce around what you just said when it comes to it, it i hate to say it but it, it it should be true at least for me it's going to be true whether people disagree with me or not when you invoke children into a situation it's almost like there shouldn't be anything to, pre to to prevent you from doing what you need to do, right? I feel like sometimes when oh, yeah. adults were just like, all right, you know, maybe that dude's a fucking asshole or whatever. But no, these are fucking, like, these are kids, right? Right. Like, there should be nothing, in my opinion, and probably I feel like you share the same opinion, and probably a lot of the people we talk to share the same opinion. Like, if it's children, we... we <laughs> Everything, all the red tape, all the fucking lines of bureaucracy, all that shit has to go out the way because we're just going to go fucking we, – we have to eliminate this threat and save these kids. These are kids. And I mean – right, yeah. It's uh, – it, 100%. Um, you know, especially in, in, a, in that circumstance where, like, I don't know how these guys – I mean, I'm sure they're I'm, – I'm sure they don't sleep at night, but I don't know how you would sleep at night you know hearing the screams of children standing yeah. in a hallway because they edited uh, you know, all that out right right yeah so we Wait. didn't hear, and i'm glad because i really don't want to fucking hear it waiting for a rifle right or waiting for whatever yeah. and it's like i would hope you know god forbid uh i ever get put in that situation uh, i would hope i have the testicular fortitude to take whatever i have in my hands and like you know either go to my death you know yeah. defending kids or uh you know kill the bad guy but like i don't know how you can i just don't know how you can't not make that decision when that's literally also your job like it's one thing yeah right yeah you know yeah. it's one thing if you're joe on the street and yeah. even if you have a concealed carry which like there's one kid that smoked a active shooter in a mall and i was like holy yeah. shit you it's know cool. but <laughs> you know if you're even let's say you are just a dude on the street with no pistol or no rifle or whatever understandable if you're a regular civilian that doesn't really get a lot of training and you're armed like it's also kind of understandable if your job is literally to serve and protect you know the people within your community and you are not doing that like it really raises the question of like you know especially like i think good people are you? give such a i think people give more like they they expect almost more out of these these small town agencies in my opinion i think like the small town people you would think because they tend to have a, a tighter relationship with law enforcement yeah you know what i mean like so you're almost like this is personal to them to where you would think it's not like you know, New York City, right, where, I don't know, you probably have 30,000 police officers, and there's no real connection to something. So you do the tactical stuff, right? Let's do the whole tech. But in this type of environment, you would think, like, let's go to the guy where the video finally just came out. It fucking, it sucks to watch. I think Grandpa tweeted it out, and, and he said something that, I mean, it makes sense. He, he almost made it 
I think what he said was like, you ever see that 250 pound dude at the bar who doesn't want to fight and he's, he's pretending like his hundred pound girlfriend's holding, yeah, him, back. holding him back. Yep. And, and I know he's not trying to be a dick. I know he's not like, I feel like he's just, he's just trying to think or put people into a position where you think like, Hey, this is that dude. But then someone else think, I think chimed in and was like, that dude is in total shock, which may be true. Yeah, that was actually Demp that said that. And, it, and, okay. and I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with it, that it I is shock. Either. The the I think the argument I'd make for both of those guys though is he shouldn't be like um, you know if the argument is that these guys haven't been trained uh, that's a leadership issue and unfortunately oh, yeah. as a cop like I I guess the what is as cold as it sounds it's like if you're a cop and this situation happens uh, you either get lucky or you get dead if you're not trained. And it's like, I don't really care whether you're trained or not. Kids are dying. You've got to go in that door and you have to either get lucky or get dead. And it's like, I'm sorry, you're, you know, I'm sorry, your police chief's a shit bag. I'm sorry. They didn't train you properly, but like, you've got a job now and your job is to, you know, die or, uh, you know, kill this bad guy. And so it's like, if he's in shock, that's, that's a pretty good illustrator that this department has not done enough to train these police. And it's like, I get that, you know, people are going to say, well, they're small town cops and they get, they don't get exposed to this regularly. And it's like, man, maybe it's time to start waking up to what's going on in the rest of the world yeah. because it's not going to get any better. And it has okay. nothing to do with access to rifles. Uh, that's been clear during COVID, right? It's, this is not a matter of rifles. This is, yeah. this is a matter of, you know, whether it be communities, civil unrest or whatever, it's like, we, well, you know, I and mean, I don't even know if it's like something rearing its ugly head, but at the end of the day, like, I think because it's, because of the internet we're getting exposed to it more um but at the end of the day it's like if you're a cop like get expect to get put in this situation and if you don't want to be put in this situation this profession is not for you yeah and so i think there's three things and i hope i remember them all but i'm going to try, try and take them in order so let me go back to this guy because he looked um he clearly was uniformed there's a lot of people that were in you know either plain clothes detect, whatever off duty i don't know what they were but this guy was clearly uniformed um and it looked like when he said, I think he said, she's in there getting, she's getting shot or she's shot. And they turned him around and he was just like nonchalantly went back. And that's where I'm thinking to him, myself, like that dude either can't, he can't fucking process what, what he's, what he knows is going on. Yeah. Or he just, he's just completely rendered ineffective at that point. Because I mean, you, you can speak to this better than me. I just feel like, Maybe from a, a position of rage, which wouldn't be the best probably position to go into a situation like this. I don't know. It might help. It might not. But I just know myself. And I know if someone's threatening, this is, okay, this is my wife we're going to talk about. Or if this is my my brother, my mom. Like, if, if anyone has ever made my mom upset, it, it sends me into a fucking rage, right? Yeah. Like, you're not going to fucking upset my mother. Like, that's how I am. So if I try to put myself in a situation where it's like, if I'm in that hallway and I know my fucking wife is shot. Bro. Why, why am I turning around? I honestly think it's, uh, I and I want to say it's probably this like same training, right? Like probably a lot of these people haven't been inoculated in stress. And the first thing they like the other side of that door is a lot of bad shit. Yes. And part of me thinks these grown men don't want to see dead kids and they don't want to see these things. And so they avoid it. Right. And the only way to avoid it in this situation is wait, wait for somebody that wants, that wants to be there more than they do. God, and so it's like, right. Man. It, it's dude. It, and, 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 um, I think what, I think that situation where it's like, you know, you can hear these screams and I, and there, there clearly seems to be some sort of disconnect. And even when these guys start getting up to like in a stack formation, the, the fear of having to face this thing seems more substantial than the necessity of having to go in there maybe. Right. And it's like, you know, this guy just got told, you, you know, right. Your wife got shot. Or she's being shot and, and maybe she, and she right? right yeah and 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 they, and he like turns around and goes to the back of the stack and it's either like this dude's either in such shock that it's not even registering after that's been said yeah. or it's a mix of like shock and he's like you know doubt right maybe maybe 
maybe this isn't true. Like maybe I'm mm -hmm. not going to, I don't want to go in there and see my wife dead. And it's like this, cause I, uh, how do I explain it? Like there's definitely been circumstances where dudes don't want to see their injuries because they don't want to see how bad they are. Right. And like, that's a, that's like a human thing. And so maybe in some respect, the reason why this all contributed to their extended cowardice is because, you know, this fear of having to go in the room and like fucking, you know, literally and no pun intended, like clean this mess up. Right. Like now you're exposed to whatever the fuck this was. So it's, yeah, it's, it's wild to see that. I think additionally too, like from a tactical level, it's, it's super frustrating because you look at the posture that, that these individuals had, you look at the, personality and it was like i want to say in the beginning of the video there actually was a police officer that was trying to move to a door trying to get into a uh, a position of advantage and his buddies were not following him and it like there's there is definitely yeah. a lack of training on behalf of that police department which is really weird because you know you expect swat or at least some police to know what they're doing right it's like you cover your buddy uh, mm -hmm. but it all just broke down because there's literally no inoculation against any sort of stress and yeah. it just you know everybody went into uh, lizard brain mode pretty much well my biggest and, and this is point two so I, i'm remembering everything i wanted to do so far pretty good i just need to drink more um <laughs> so i it was it was the thing that i ended up like tweeting out from the after i watched the whole thing i took a screenshot of that that fucking guy with the ballistic helmet going up to the hand sanitizer oh yeah uh what was I, it so there was a well, SFD like i can't what the fuck it's 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 so if it is a police officer and it's not like a doc or a medic it's uh um, hey, that's a fair point it's the attempt to kind of disconnect yourself from the circumstances mm -hmm. uh because i i'm i want to believe that nobody is as openly calloused or like yeah. not give a fuck you know it's like oh like because no he's pro he's probably not aware of what he's doing and and so in order to like kind of take the monotony or like the fear or the shock out of like the whole situation he's doing something normal yeah. that he would do every day if it or if it's a doc or it's a medic then they're doing it because they literally are probably gonna have to start handling some bodies so there was somebody that was making an argument okay. that like because this they, they looked at Acceptable. him and like, that is that those are two valid things i'm glad like someone is saying that because i just i'm too upset to even <laughs> <laughs> yeah i well, can't consider the, those things and i'm glad you're doing it because and true. as we as we look at it right like as we're looking at this you're like well this motherfucker is getting hand sanitizer and there's still children dying in this room yeah, and it's yeah. like the reason why we're pissed is because nothing has happened yeah. and we're watching people kind of socially disconnect or disconnect themselves from trauma which is natural for people that haven't been trained and so you're like you know you're 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 watching you know basically cowardly men be coward and d disconnect themselves from these circumstances and it's like if this was a doc then like it's understandable and some people have made the argument that it's a doc only because he he has some of the same uniform stuff but he's in civilians and he's kind of pudgy and out of shape and uh you know doesn't really like move or even look like he belongs on like the police force so i would you know it's well my take on him was that he was some sort of maybe I don't know, shift captain, maybe, maybe because he yeah. has, because he has the fucking Gucci gear helmet. Yeah. Like, you know, like nobody else is really in that, but him and he's yeah. well dressed. So if he's the doc, I would expect, I mean, I don't even know if these fucking police departments would have one. Would they? I, I mean, know. there's some SWAT teams. I would expect paramedics to just be there. I wouldn't expect like some civilian clothes, not there. Like maybe in a big city, I kind of, but I would just expect normal paramedics to be there. I guess I don't know. I mean, I know I mean, there's a good like point. SWAT docs and stuff like yeah. that on most SWAT teams that are that are just like PAs that um that do it. But, but wouldn't you yeah, want to I mean, look the part like everyone else so you don't stand out, or you want to stand out? I don't. Know. I mean, I think in in the military that makes sense. In law yeah. enforcement, it you know it it really doesn't. Um, okay. Unless you're like in some really massive firefight, but at the end yeah. of the day, if you're the doc, then you know you're going to be wearing whatever you got to wear. Yeah, it, it it it's still like it's infuriating to see, but I I can also understand, you know, whether it's a cop or a medic, why it was done. It just it doesn't make it right, but it's like you know, this dude is you're watching a grown man disconnect 
you know, from yes. something traumatic. And it's like, yeah, it, it, should, should he be doing it? Absolutely not. Is it infuriating? Sure. Yeah. But like 90% of the people who have absolutely no exposure to trauma or the military or, yeah. you know, police being a, you know, being a police officer in a firefight would probably end up doing the same thing. All right. So I, I am tracking and I've got, I got uh, two final things, right? So give me one uh, second. Let me, let yeah. me go pee real quick. Yeah, you do that. You know what? It's a pee break. Cause I'm doing All right. All right. Hey. <laughs> So I'm going to feel this. I don't want people who are actually listening to this to just be like, oh, I don't know when the fuck they're coming back. Um, and so it's not dead space. But this is my point. So I, granted, I do drink bourbon throughout this. Usually I'm pretty good. But I do want to know how people like Rogan and I, I, don't, I don't listen to him, but I think Jocko does some really long, like people who do really long podcasts, like how do you not have to take a fucking I think- break? I actually think Rogan did used to oh, uh, okay, mic in. Back. So it's- <laughs> Sorry, he used to mic in his piss breaks. So really? um, yeah, there was an interview he did with like Chris D'Elia or um, another comedian and they were like, hey man, I got to piss. And he's like, oh, we'll go pee. And then they like pa- like paused and then went and peed. So there there are times I know that they've like went and peed. But, I yeah. it, dude, it's tough for me because I I drink so much throughout a day anyway, not just alcohol, but I mean right. I drink that time, like same. <laughs> it's like I I don't know. I see I see. I'll, I'll be in my office sometimes. Like if if there's days when I'm in the office for the whole time, and I, I got one dude, I'm just like, dude, you've been here like seven hours. I haven't seen you move. Right. I um <laughs> I have to I have to leave because where I work, I it's like contained, and so we don't have a bathroom within containment. <laughs> That's so awesome. I have to leave containment and go to a hall, go into this hallway and then go pee and then have to re-enter containment. It's not a long walk and it's not super hard, but it's like right to the point where it is inconvenient. And so <laughs> you know like, what you it, just described, you just described deployment piss. Right. Oh yeah. Right. Just and dude, you have no you have no idea how many. This is times why we I've have like, bottles. <laughs> I like looked around in my office and been like, man, I could really use a Gatorade bottle. Yeah. Right <laughs> oh my god, it was the worst. Like I don't feel like I did it as much as I did it. And this is the worst. This and I'm just gonna say it because it's funny. And this is what makes it even the worst. Like my last rotation, we were based out of Arif John in Kuwait, right? So I had guys in Jordan, Qatar, UAE, and, and those were fine because the bathrooms were pretty close. But I was stuck in like zone six in Kuwait. And I don't know if you've been there, but zone six in Kuwait was where we were at. It was it was just far enough and annoying enough that I didn't yeah. want to walk to the fucking Port of John. So I would just pee in the bottle. We were uh, we were in, out Africa. In, the morning. <laughs> in Africa. We had like, I don't know, we were like maybe two you know, two containerized housing units away from the bathroom. So like realistically, if you had to get up at night, you could do it. But there was, we saw so many scorpions and like uh, <laughs> spot, snakes and stuff. It's like, I'm not, I'm not going to wake up drowsy and have to go pee and get yeah. nabbed by some it's fucking an unnecessary risk, right? Why no, I'm it? just peeing in the skate raid bottle. Yeah. It's right here. Yeah. Right. It's right. <laughs> it's, man. That's great. All right. Okay. Never so these changes. two things. All right. I got them. I'm not going to forget it. Wait, hold on. What was the fucking fourth? <laughs> Shit. No, no, no. Okay, I do got the fourth. All right. The third right. is this. All right. Do you watch Stranger Things by chance? Yeah, I love it. I love you it. Watch I'm a four? huge Dungeons and Dragons fan. Yeah, I love okay. the shit out of that stuff. The Stranger Things 4 was pretty well. Did you watch all four? Uh-huh. Okay, cool. All right. So I just took my daughter to the Stranger Things thing in San Francisco last two weekends ago. That was actually nice. pretty cool. It's actually pretty cool. I mean, I think it's in like it's here. I think it's in New York. Maybe there's one in Chicago right now, but they do an amazing job of like actually turning when, like once you actually go through it, it puts you into like the mall setting, right? Where mm-hmm. it, it looks like you're actually in the eighties and shit. It's actually really fucking cool. That's really. awesome. Yeah. It was really fucking cool. But anyway, the reason I bring this up, so there's a scene in stranger things season four where the, 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 the army dudes are coming for, for L right. 
and they're 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 going through that little underground bunker thing that they got. And you got dudes, you got two dudes next to each other with ballistic shields. You remember this scene? Uh, I think they're, so. they're like Russian and they, and like the dudes would pop up behind them and fire rounds off. Oh them. yeah. 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 Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. There's actually, I watched the gray man today. There's something pretty similar to that too on the gray man. It's worth watching. Okay. Gray man. I, 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 I didn't know if I wanted to watch it, but you're telling me to. So. It's and not you also bad. Told me, it's you also said good. terminal list was pretty good, right? Uh, I did. I actually really liked terminal list. Yeah. There's a few, I got to catch up. I, I started rewatching Oz. I don't know if you ever saw that on HBO. Like, uh, 20, man, that is a walk down ago. memory lane. Yeah. It is. Oz and uh, I used to, uh, not the Sopranos is obviously much younger. Well, yeah. A lot of these people predate Oz, Sopranos, but, like the, man, the security the guards. Yeah. The, like the, the guard is uh, Tony Soprano's wife. Yep. Yeah. yeah it's oh, yeah, dang. The cast, yeah. The cast is like these people's careers. Like, and I was making this joke to my wife the other day. It's like, um, there's two dudes in there who go on to become like the world's best insurance salesman, right? Because one, what is it, O'Reilly? He be he's he's like the the State Farm guy oh, right now. Yeah. yeah. And then Schillinger is the fucking farmer's insurance guy. I have not seen Oz in <laughs> ages. That's a good. That's a good series, though. Yeah, it is. That's, so that's why I, I'm. Almost, I think I just finished season one. I like. I I never actually watched. I just would catch it. You know, as a kid, I'd like mm. watch HBO. I'm like, oh, this is fucking weird but now that i'm watching it i was an older and i kind of understand it it's, it's a really good show um all right so there's that scene right so they're doing the ballistic shield stuff we see that take place not that scene but we see guys show up in the the, the school hallway with those ballistic shields is that a realistic response you think they should have done something similar or oh just total hollywood no i mean it's it's realistic in that like the police use a lot of ballistic shields the uh, the u.s military doesn't really use them very much because they're basically single purpose which is like you know your number one your number one man going in the room um yeah i mean the minute they honestly the minute they got the shields they're literally that they that was the minute the rest of the excuses kind of ran out and somebody was saying that they may only be rated for pistol or whatever and it's like i don't really give a really? shit what it's rated to made for that no, I mean, somebody was any sense on the surface. Like, no, is... none whatsoever. I, I want to say I, I saw it on social media saying like they made the argument that it was only rated for pistol, whatever. Well, like it was I, probably one of those cops that was holding it then. Right. But I'm at the sad. end of the day, like realistically, uh, if you have a shield, you, then then you have everything you need yeah. if you've got everything else. I know that sounds kind of weird, but like if you have a Halligan tool. Uh, then you are not in danger of injuring your breachers because you can cover your door with the shield. So the shield basically protects whatever activity you need in order to like, whether you're prepping the door with a demo charge, whether you're hitting it with a Halligan tool, you could beat that door, you know, with whatever you need and put the, the, the shield literally on the door to protect, you know, your assaulters, um, and you're fine. And then as you're entering, you can enter the door and the room at your own pace because you've got one shield or two shields. Uh, you can literally have a rifleman shoot over the guy with the shield. You just, you know, you got to squat. But like the, it it becomes a, you know, uh, the ability to dominate that room and dominate whatever actions you have with that amount of protection. So like the minute the shields showed up, it was like, Bro, you sh it shouldn't even have been a, hey, let's put a hasty plan together. It was literally like, put that shield on the door, get four guys, go in there and kill that dude, right? And it was waiting, waiting, waiting. They just continued to wait more. So that, I guess that, that, that does feed into my, my final question on this because, like I said, it, it is kind of a topic. I know you've posted some stuff lately for those who haven't got Twitter accounts or whatever, but you have posted – you've done some training with this, but – Okay, let's let let's let's play the perfect world scenario, right? Red and his his guys respond. What should those dudes have done once they got into that hallway? Okay, so opinion. yeah, so if we're assuming that uh, we can, we all right, so let's just say it's like Red's team. Yep. Uh, with just rifles and plate carriers, if we knew where the shooting was coming from, uh, all right, so we know. Like we see the room, we know the door, we check the door, see if the door is open or closed, right? You basically just jiggle the handle. If you, the door opens, you go in and you do, you know, a dynamic entry um, with four dudes and you engage the target and you kill the bad guy. If it has to have a tool that needs to be opened, um, you know, then you find or get the tool and then do the exact same thing. But realistically, the minute, 
the minute you hear shooting or the minute you know where the location of a threat is um and it's a hostage scenario not even a hostage scenario if there are people being killed in that room not, not not even necessarily active but like if they're like hey people got shot in this room the dude's still in there there's still people in there we don't know what's going on you cannot assume first of all it's really stupid to assume everybody's dead and uh it's you know it's even worse to just let that person continue shooting so i mean i, I would like to say that the first thing you should have done is if you have four people you go in there with everything you possibly can muster to try and kill that guy and if that means there were four more dead bodies in that room then so be it yeah and i think that's what's so fucking frustrating <laughs> is that i just don't real. Know, i just don't know if enough of the average american has can understand that i think they understand i think they understand right, it. I, it. I really think the reaction the the real reaction is like it, it's um how do i say this without insulting people i think everybody wanted those cops to go in there and do their job yeah but when it comes down to if people had to do that job it's uh it's not as like those cops jobs aren't easy uh, but right. they're in a position and they should have had the training and they you know they raise their right hand yeah. to do that job um and you know there's some people that be like well if i was in there you know it'd be different it's like man i don't know i don't know what you've been exposed to but if you're just regular joe off the street yeah you'd probably fold just as easy too because yep. you know i've been i've been to iraq for 15 months i've been in some really shitty places and i've seen enough dead bodies to know you know that i don't really like looking at them a whole lot and it's like it, it's when you have dudes that are hardened sf guys and navy seals and whatever and they you know, they break down when they see kids getting hurt overseas. Um, it is probably as bad, if not worse, when it comes to being in the United States and hearing screams and hearing, you know, blood curdling noises in English. So, yep. you know, yeah. regular dudes yeah. like I, I get it, like nobody is everybody is completely justified in being pissed off at these cops because they should have done something. But um and I haven't really seen it very much, but there has been some like the chest beating of like, well, it would be different if, if it was me. It's like, man, it, yeah, that's, would, that's easy. It to would say be really, hard. yeah, it'd be yeah. really hard. Yeah. Like you can be mad at the cops, be pissed off at the right. cops, but like, unless until you've been exposed to some pretty yeah. horrible. Why would you shit. want to? Why would you like, that's yeah. an awful thing to want to try. Right. I mean, <laughs> I would, love, I don't yeah. fucking want to experience that. I, it, would not be cash money yeah it's um, <laughs> yeah, no there's no cash not, money yeah it would not be it's it would not be an ideal situation at all but it's like that's what makes you know it's the this kid that uh shot homeboy 40 meters away is a perfect example of like you know when of of personalities that you know don't fold under pressure so they do exist there's americans yeah. that do exist but i think for the most part you know it's so you really don't know how you're going to be until it, it's there. You're right, exactly. Uh, I mean, that's the segue, of course. Right, that's what I wanted to talk about next was this this mall shooting in Greenwood. And um, man, I know Clay Martin just demonstrated it with that video, but still, I mean, do you do you think that is legit, or do you think that's kind of just he got lucky, or there's like some urban legend going on here? Because he was saying his granddad showed him how to shoot. Uh, still, it, like. Red, and, I can't hit the fucking wall right here with a handgun. <laughs> this one I'm, I'm pointing at, I am so bad. And I I really want to believe that. I mean, he did do it, but I don't know if this the reports are accurate, but I mean he killed that guy. That happened. I'm just like, and I know Clay's out there with his fucking sandals, like, watch this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ping. Yeah. I honestly I I mean, I think it's the distance. I, I think yeah. um you know, I think this kid shot his pistol a lot with his granddad. And once he, Pretty I mean, cool, and th the way I see it is like with a rifle, I look at my target, I engage my target and my sights rest on the target and I engage again. And I'm like hitting the same spot, right? Like I'm hitting yeah. just the shoulder in a four inch or two inch or one inch square. I think the way we got to mm -hmm. think about how this kid shot his pistol was that like, especially in the amount of time that he did was he got on target with his front sight and kept his front sight on the dude and just he didn't Molly rip it, a fire kind right of but he basically yeah like he he did probably some decent shots at the at, he shot at that guy uh knowing he was going to hit something right because even your front sight post at that distance on a human-sized target is not go you're not going to be hitting a specific part you're going to be hitting you know 
the chest somewhere within the chest and with a yeah. you know i don't know what pistol he shot but with it 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 does not become fun when you're trying to engage a target past you know 20 yards or 20 meters um with a pistol so i you know the way fuck man if it was me and i did it and i saw somebody that far it's literally just like all right bro put it on the front sight line it up and let her rip you know and i think he i mean he hit dude eight out of ten times uh and obviously killed him so it goes to show that like i mean this kid was probably you know ripping these nine mil rounds and they were all kind of you know hitting him all in the right spot so for you know for a pistol if you're doing that then i think he's he's basically cracked the code in terms of how to yeah so like i mean i give all the credit in the world to that dude um i really i really do um, my only thing and this is what i kind of want to get your take on because i don't want like we could probably talk for an hour on what he did but i don't want to do that because obviously we already know what happened but my issue is the response like there's the response of like well he shouldn't have even been there in that <laughs> hall with it like like we have right. a, again it's a, it's it's almost like the kyle rittenhouse thing all over again where it's like a guy who did the right thing is somehow fucking being targeted for demonization. And I yeah. don't understand why that, why is that in our fucking country? Like knowing our foundation, knowing the origin, knowing our, like how the, the second amendment exists, why it exists, knowing all of that, how we've gotten to a point in our society in 2022, where someone who literally saved literally countless, we don't know how many fucking dudes this guy could have killed if that guy wasn't there. Right. You don't know, right? Because shit, if he's got if he's got 30 rounds at a minimum, you want to kind of just let's just pencil in 20, right? Let's do that. How many lives that dude saved? And and that's not being celebrated. The guy's being fucking almost to a point, he's being assassinated for being that guy with a gun. Yeah, there were people that were like uh that basically said, you know, how many people were injured that you know in this in this you know uh, shootout basically was what they're referring and then his two misses you know well were did and did he injure anybody with oh, his I'm misses sorry <laughs> right yeah right. so and it is it is funny to see people just like because that's the other ironic part is it's like well this is the perfect example of what a good guy with a gun does yeah. is he engages and terminates the target and it was like you know, everybody who would argue against it is like, well, let me now let me now just sharpshoot this concept that's, you know, been proven to work. And it's funny because the best thing is, is it's not the best thing, but like the ironic thing is Uvalde, they're like, well, there were plenty of good guys with guns and they didn't do anything. And it's like, no, 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 they're just armed. They're just people who are armed because a good guy with a gun has a very specific action that is conducted when he sees yeah. a threat. And, and that's what a good guy is. Right. And so, I mean yeah this this i mean the kids should be the kids should never have to buy a beer that for the fucking kids should be celebrated but instead oh, yeah. he's gonna somehow be targeted and it may even get up to the level of the administration to where they're like well we got to figure out a way to prevent people from carrying gun. that's a great story however it's like no this guy should be the fucking this dude he should be the one getting the goddamn presidential medal of freedom or well, whatever I think, they and hand I, and out and the nice part is, is uh, it's, I mean, it would be hard to do it, but the, the states, that state has a, what is it, like a, a universal concealed carry. So you don't need a permit for a concealed carry. So it's also a perfect example of, you know, allowing your citizens to arm themselves within the, you know, the context of the Second Amendment. They, we, they, we don't lawfully require a permit to carry a firearm. And it's like, oh, my God, it's actually worked. It's actually prevented a shooting. Is this Indiana? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Universal concealed carry, and and the interesting thing about that too is everybody has. Uh, how do I put it? So because there was no uh, significant death, because it wasn't a mass murder, there's no, um, uh, there's like no trauma associated with it for it to be an argument other than a bunch of fucking well butts right so like mm -hmm. uvaldi it was like all these children are dead i have this you know i can pile up these dead children and show you how bad this thing is and so when there aren't dead bodies you know on behalf of an ar-15 or some you know mentally unstable kid it's like oh well the guy that did it had a pistol and he missed two times so you know his two yeah, shots let, they hurt anybody else to... 
it's just this weird attempt to find fault in something where it's like, actually, this is probably one of the better things that, you know, has happened in the context of preventing an action. I agree. Shooting. I think it's fucking, I like, to me, it's like the more that's come out, I'm just like, is did that really happen? Like, it's fucking incredible. I think it's crazy because yep. only because I know my limitations with a handgun and I can't hit the fucking wall. Right <laughs> there. Like, yep. that's just what blows me away because I would love, if, if it were me in that situation, I would love to think I would do the same thing. But I think in my mind, I'd be like, how can I get closer to this guy? Because I'm never going to hit him. That's well, and that's what I. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a great shot with a rifle. I'm a horrible shot with a pistol, and that's the no, first thing I am. I think so if you're like, that way, what does that make me? <laughs> I like look at it and be like, man, I could probably hit this guy at 20 yards, 20 meters, maybe like 40. This is much I'm gonna have to maneuver up there, you know, try and see if yeah. I get shot trying to walk up there and smoke this kid. Which is weird. I wonder, and I, I wonder. I kind of want your take on this. I know this is anecdotal, but my brother, right? He's never been in the military, but he he's got a lot of he's got a lot of weapons. Um, but he has rifles and he's got handguns and he's really good with a handgun. He's not very good with a rifle. And him and I are like the co total converse. Hmm. And I remember it was probably four or five years ago at this point, this range is closed now because of the laws changed down in Southern California where he's at. But I remember we went up to this like middle of nowhere fucking range. Um, and we're sitting there. His buddy's got this fucking, I think I may have sent this to you guys probably years ago. I can send it again, but it's, he's got like this Gucci out fucking 308 thing, probably AR 10 with this massive scope. And I'm just sitting there like picking off 800 meter targets. Like it's nothing. Cause it really isn't. There's no recoil. He's got so much shit in it in the scope and they can't hit it even with that. But then we get to the handguns and he pulls out his, my brother's got like, I think he's got a nine, he's got a 40. And I think he's got a, he's got a, your favorite. Well, I don't know if it's your, I don't know if you clown on people with 1911, but he has a 1911. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's got all these handguns and, and he's really, really good with it. Like he's so fucking pinpoint. Cause that's all he's ever really shot with was these handguns. Doesn't mm -hmm. do a lot of rifle stuff. And I'm the opposite. Like any handgun experience prior to that day was i may be qualified with the military's nine millimeter twice That's yeah like the beretta maybe twice i think maybe three times and i suck like i can't hit anything but i can shoot that thing i i can shoot the rifle stuff at targets all day like it's nothing and he's like i don't get how you do that i'm like well bro i don't get how you do that like it's the same thing it's right. what you train with right yeah i mean it definitely is um i think there's a lot of reasons why most people are typically better shots with rifles than pistols. Um, and I mean, the, the funny thing is like, I think rifles come more naturally for me, just obviously because of the military. Yeah. Um, and right. Pistols for me, like I'm consistent enough to know my limits. Uh, and then I can also kind of self-diagnose what my problems are when it comes to like my misses with, with pistol, but at the same time, like pistols are black magic, right? Like you're not there. They're, there's the stability is literally just your ability to squeeze this thing and let it rip. And then like, try and guide it back into, you know, your front sight for, you know, your rear and front sights. And so for me, it's always been really weird, but with a rifle, it feels like a natural, like fighting stance where you, yeah, I mean, like I, you're I, literally, you know, yeah. you literally are putting yourself behind it and then looking down the barrel and engaging. So it really is weird. Like, cause I do know some, like my dad is a great pistol shot. He's yeah. a good rifle shot, but like, he is a, like, he's a much better pistol shooter than me. And no matter how much he's taught me growing up, I've just always been like consistently not super awesome with the pistol. Did he have a military at all, or is it? Yeah, just... he's a he's a SF medic actually. Oh, he so, oh, really? oh wow, so yeah. he just runs in the family. <laughs> <laughs> he uh he was in uh, 19th group, and so uh, he got out like shortly after I was born. Uh, but yeah. yeah, he was a special forces medic, um, and uh, you know spent a little bit of his time in Fort Hood as a, a medic there, and then he was a medic in the 82nd, and so like yeah, he's kind of done the whole thing too. Um, I got to meet some of the dudes. I, ironically enough, some of my ROTC instructors were his first sergeant when he was in group. And so like they, <laughs> they recognized my last name. And then because I was going to a school that was fairly, lo fairly, fairly local, uh, you know, that's, that was how they recognized me. So it was pretty funny. That's pretty oh yeah. That, oh yeah. I'm looking at the picture. You yeah. So that's the, that's the range. And that's the fucking the, the, like, so my brother's friend that brought that, like, he spends oh, damn, way, that thing's a bazooka, dude. He spends way too much money on <laughs> weapons, right? Like he's, He's got a lot of money and he spends it on a lot of stuff that he likes. He happens to like guns, but that's just one. That's like his fucking AR-10 or whatever the hell it is. I don't know. But look at that thing. 
Yeah. Yeah. It 800 meters, like, like it was nothing, tech. dude. That's legit. Yeah, yeah. I bet. It, it was, it was, and I'm sitting there. Is it, there's no recoil because he put all kinds of crazy buffer spring fucking aftermarket shit into it. Like super easy. But, but yeah, like that's the type of stuff that just, but you give me a handgun, dude, I can't hit the wall. I really can't. And well, I don't that's understand the, it. The, the interesting, yeah, I, I honestly don't either because <laughs> it feels like rifle, even at distance, you should be less consistent than when you are with pistol. Like when, I, but I've, what I've, what I understand for pistol is there's a lot more, the, all the idiosyncrasies in your grip and your trigger pull are magnified when you're doing yeah. it. And so like, I have a really bad habit of squeezing my lower two fingers when I pull a trigger, like it's almost, it's almost natural to do that. And with a rifle, it doesn't matter because you're not torquing, you know, yeah. two pounds of pressure on a rifle, changing your, the impact you're around all that much. But with a pistol, you know, you're literally pulling your shot, you know, one inch to the, to the bottom or one inch low of what you're really aiming at. So if for pistol, like, for rifle, all you have to do is just shoot rifle more and then you get used to it. For pistol, you have to like have good reps and you have to train good reps because if you just like sit in your garage and cock it and pull it and cock it and pull it, you're not really going to know where the round goes. And you may be, you may be getting reps on your shitty grip with your, with your shitty trigger pull with all this bad shit. And then you're like, I'm go to the range and kill this. And then it's nothing but shit. And you're like, what did I do wrong? It's Everything. <laughs> everything your grip is yeah, shit your trigger pull is shit yeah yeah so that's how it ends up i think i think it was funny this was probably four or five years ago so there's this range up in lincoln california which is kind of out in the middle of nowhere and i remember we went and did a team building exercise because this dude abby <laughs> i love abby he's you abby's funny anyway big rifle guy but he has a ton of handguns and so we went out because all we can do is shoot handguns at this range because california and uh, yeah, we go out there and I, I, I honestly remember, dude, this, this target must have not have been more than 15 meters, maybe 10 and everybody's hitting it. And like, I went and it was one of those zombie targets where it's supposed to just like splatter, like the color whenever you hit it. Right. Like, the, yeah, yeah. There's nothing on that target, bro. <laughs> I'm just like, this doesn't make it like I'm to the point where I'm getting mad almost. Like this is this is you guys are giving me blanks. Like this is right? real. <laughs> what is this? What is this bullshit? <laughs> this is dumb. Yeah. But no, I know I get it. I know what I need to do. I need to do, just do it more. And I just need to get out of this fucking state and shoot in a real state. But anyway. And honestly, is like there's a bunch of other stuff that comes into play too. Like there's some people that just don't shoot Glocks well oh. and I shoot a Glock. Okay. But I'm not super great with it. I bought a SIG and I shoot that SIG. Like it's the cheat code now. And I mean, why is that different? Do you think grip angle, uh, pistol weight, um, you know, recoil impulse. It's like rifles, right? Like if you shoot, uh, a civilian M4 or civilian AR versus a military AR. Like if you shot one of my rifles that was, I've got a 16 inch, uh, AR, that has a buffer, uh, a captured buffer spring. So it's not a spring in the back. It's basically a piston. It's got a, you know, a two and a half pound trigger and a, a gas through suppressor on it. If you shot that, it feels like shooting a BB gun, but well, it's that's exactly how that, this, that's how that picture I sent you. Found. Right. It's exactly the same as yeah. it's the, but it's shooting this, you know, it's like the same platform as an M4. And when you shoot an M4, it's easy to shoot, but it, it'll have a lot more recoil impulse. Right. So it's the same with pistols, right? Like, you know, sometimes for people, just the the, the grip angle of a Glock, uh, you know, just does not work well for them. And you, ironically enough, when we're talking about 1911s, a lot of guys that shoot 1911s, and I grew up shooting a 1911, do have problems with like kind of an angled pistol grip because they're used to locking their wrist um, at a 90 degree angle. And then, um, you know the they're just used to having a better grip plus like 1911 triggers are pretty okay and so you have a lighter trigger pull so there's a bunch of things that come into play so i would suggest if you shoot shitty with a glock and you you know you're just tired of shooting shitty shoot your buddy sig or whatever else and you you and if you're shooting improves and you kind of know what your problem is and it's like yeah, i mean yeah he's... but i shoot bad with a glock and it's like well, <laughs> you should shoot good with whatever you shoot yeah well, well what's funny about my brother is like he swears by yeah, just 1911 for home defense, and I know that's kind of like a big funism. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a big <laughs> ongoing argument, right? I guess on the internet, right? So this is a good segue as well. So what would what what is Red's personal preference for 
home defense. And you're not in a compound, right? You're in a fucking, I don't know, 2,500 square foot house, right? You got four bedrooms. What, what, what is your preference for home defense? What do you suggest? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> if I was telling, so how, how do I say this? So if you, <laughs> I would not recommend, I would not initially recommend a pistol or shot or shotgun. I would probably say get a, uh, a, a rifle or an AR pistol of some type, something in between. What is an like, AR pistol? That's, I don't understand that. So, uh, legally you can't have a rifle below the length of 14 and a half inches uh, bear with barrel length below 14 and a half inches, uh, and okay. it not be considered a short barreled rifle, which is oh. then, which is then governed by the ATF and NFA, et cetera, et cetera. So mm. the, what happened with disabled veterans was they still wanted to shoot, you know, rifle caliber pistols. So they put a pistol brace on it and then had it below the length of four and a half, 14 and a half. You can ingenuity, shoulder as we talked about earlier, ingenuity. right? Exactly. You can't, you can't legislate ingenuity. Yep. Uh, so, so in any case though, um, you know, you can still shoulder it. So I would, you know, if you, if you're comfortable with a, you know, 14 and a half inch rifle in your home or uh, you know, whatever, below that in terms of pistol um i would run that and what would what i would consider is the material of your home so if you live in like you know a home that's existed since probably the 80s and on it's probably nothing but drywall and yeah uh, you know everything will penetrate so like people making the argument the buckshot and nine mil won't go through drywall or completely full of shit like it'll go right through it so the best thing to do is uh sub loads or frangible rounds and frangible rounds they have plenty of five five six frange rounds they basically just break up on impact um and really for me Sounds what painful. i what's that sounds painful uh, it's not fun. I would imagine it's not fun getting <laughs> shot at, but the nice part is, is it also won't kill your neighbor. So if you <laughs> do miss, it's going to hit drywall. It will probably penetrate the first layer of drywall and then it'll just kind of poof yeah. uh, after it comes out the other side. So for the most part, if you use frange rounds, it's good home defense and you're not really super worried about it. If you use sub loads, there's still a really good chance it'll go through drywall, but it won't like, it, it's not going to go through, you know, the neighborhood. Um, personally, uh, because sub rounds in five, five, six, aren't much of a thing. Uh, I have a 300 blackout, um, like, a like a pistol with a seven inch barrel that i have a can on. And I also have a elevated, uh, optic on it. That's just a red dot. So it's on a cheek riser. So it, it comes from personal experience, uh, when you're doing CQB and you want to pull the gun up to your eye line without having a lot of other head movement, you usually want your optic on a higher mount. And so I just have it on that. So if I do have to engage my target, I'm not moving around to engage. I just lift my rifle up, flick it. It's already off safe. And then I'm engaging and it's a 300 blackout with um, Barnes copper round. So the minute it hits meat, it expands pretty high um, and it's quiet and they're sub rounds. So they're not, you know, uh, smoking my neighbor so there's like the perfect home defense gun would probably be a shorter 300 blackout with some sort of red dot and a light on it like those are kind of the it, it have a red dot and a light on whatever rifle you use and then the best i would say for home defense would probably be a 300 blackout because it's got the weight it doesn't have you know you're not looking for um something necessarily small but you've got a heavier round that's still moving pretty fast and has a lot and imparts a lot of kinetic energy when it hits your target so this is this is now we're getting inside baseball i like this let me ask you why the light uh so i can identify what i'm shooting at so um you want to if someone's broken in are you, are you trying to conceal your your own location well so i've got kids and so yeah, what I, so no. so if i'm you know if your boy is going down the stairs and some and i'm assuming somebody's broken in my house then you, i'm not gonna run with a light on ever um I mean, I'm gonna be in, <laughs> gonna be in my ranger panties, hopefully with my plate carrier, <laughs> Your murder cult ranger, yeah, panties. right. <laughs> and I'm gonna be as quiet as possible, and then the only time, so like the way I think about it is like I don't want he can't hear me or he can't see me until I want him to or right. allow him to, and so the only time I'm turning my light on is when I'm presenting to identify the target and engage. So as I'm, you know, as I'm bringing it up to my eye line, I turn the light on, it's off safe. And then I'm deciding on whether or not, you know, it's a target. Mm -hmm. And if you have, you know, you, you, I would strongly, I mean, I would almost 
say that you should be required to have a light if you've, you know, if you're, if you've got kids in your house, just so it's not when your little booger eaters making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the middle of the night, right. And wake you up. So yeah. all, like, right. And it's like, there was actually a Twitter post we had about, I, I had, uh, there was a dude that had smoked some poor donkey thinking it was a, really? um, a coyote in a bush. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a dude on Instagram. How'd I miss that. It's called like gloom crew or whatever. And this dude is like, you know, the picture is this unfortunate dead donkey. And he's like standing next to it with oh, like poo poo face. And he, you know, he has, this long diatribe of you know um P, P, pid of your target because you know even though you've never seen this thing before and you were assuming it was a coyote then you may end up shooting a donkey but he thought that there was a coyote mm. in a bush yeah, he thought the noise that was made in the bush was a coyote so like instead of turning a light on or even throwing infrared at it or moving he's like let's throw some heat into it and just like burns this poor i mean a donkey donkey's to I've seen coyotes and donkeys probably right. sizably larger. So it was clear he didn't know what he was doing because he had no PID. Killed this poor donkey, and it's donkey. like donkey you know, it is, is is as much as it would suck to shoot a donkey. It would really, really suck to shoot a family member. Uh, yes, that you mistake as a as yeah. as, as a criminal. So <laughs> like, uh, just throw some light on the situation. Or, or or like turn your lights on like you don't have to have a light on your gun but have some way to be like yes this is not my child or not my wife or not my yeah. dog and then and then you can make that decision you know you can make an informed decision yeah. and at the end of the day like <laughs> a dude breaking into your house the last thing or one of the few things he's going to expect is like this bright light and then getting shot yeah right no, most people aren't good. gonna you get a little psyops going on at the same time so so definitely a light and then having an optic is just nice because it's an, e it's a easier reference than iron sights. And so you just throw it up, you put the red dot on, you know, whatever your holdover is for me, it's the chin. And then you, you, Wait, let you it aim at the chin. Yeah. So because you have, you have an optic. So like, um, like I love it. you're familiar with EOTex, um, yeah. like yeah. an EOTech in, in, inside, if it's been zero to a hundred inside 20 meters, uh, your actual point of aim is the um, like the notch of their chest, like right when their mm. you know when their neck basically meets their yeah. chest. Yeah. That's what you're aiming at, and you're actually hitting them in their a box, which is you know right between their basically center line of their nipples. And oh, if really? the, yeah, the mm -hmm. higher you put your optic on, so like let's say I, say I put my optic on a two inch riser, um, where I aim is I aim at the bottom of dude's chin or just right at the neck. And I'm hitting um, right in the center of the chest. And so like hmm. another another saying we have, or I typically have, and I was taught when I was doing CQB, is you say in the neck, in the neck, in the neck, or in the head, in the chest, in the chest, in the chest. And so when you're close, you're telling yourself in the neck. And then when you're far, you're saying in the chest. And that's basically where your point of aim, point of impact is, is when I'm indoors, it's in the neck and I'm shooting you. I, I, I aim at your neck and I shoot you in the chest and then far, you know, I'm literally just shooting you in the chest and hitting you in the chest. All right. So for people who have no idea what the hell you're talking about, why is there <laughs> that much variation? Uh, because your height of bore, so uh, where the round comes out of the rifle, is not lined up properly with your uh, with where your optic is, and so you know, even though it's negligible at two inches, it's also it also matters where you zero it. So you're in theory, if you've zeroed it at a hundred, where your optic yep. and your yep. rifle basically see and meet are at a hundred. And so as you basically kind of zoom it out a little bit further, the differentiation in where you aim and where you hit is going to be uh, exacerbated. Uh, so that's like, if you are, you know, it, with anything with, especially with firearms, if you were planning on trying to become proficient in it you you do have to um know kind of what your your data looks like right so guys be like oh i zeroed 100 and then i just let it rip and it's like all right so if you zero at 100 what does your what do your wh where are you aiming and what do your shots look like at 50 what do they look like at 10 and it's good to know that because you're never going to know what distance you're shooting at unless you have a rangefinder or you're really good at milling targets. Yeah. And so it's easier just to say, this is within a hundred or this is within 20. This is where I can kind of generally aim and where I'm going to hit my target. And then you use that feedback to, you know, make your adjustment, but it's, it's good. Even after you've zeroed 
to know you know what your 20 yard shot looks like because it is it is different and i have seen some people with targets at like 10 feet when you know you really shouldn't be within anything at 10 feet that would suck that's hilarious like <laughs> I, I mean i i watch like dudes that you know should should know better or do know better uh you know hit targets that are not in the a zone or off the a zone or completely you know like you know on the wall or whatever and it's it is funny uh, after the first time it stops being funny after like the fifth time and then you got to start yelling at people, but it happens. <laughs> it does happen. Ah, oh, man. There's a million ways to take this. Um, let's get off of that for a okay. second. How you doing on time? You good? Oh yeah. I've got all the time in the world for you. Oh, it was, we'll, be here, <laughs> we'll be here till tomorrow. No, I'll be on the floor by then. Um, all right. Let me, let me take it into kind of, this this i don't know depending on when did you come in i can I, so i was a 2006 so i was in college during uh in 911 i was a, a freshman no 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 i was a sophomore uh and then i got my commission in 2006 were well, you were a sophomore in 01 yeah so uh um, wait are we the same age yeah man, i'll text you i'll text you my birthday yeah no i thought you I, for some reason i thought you were like brinks age i don't know why no 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 no, no. Okay. Well, that's good though. That, but so that's my point. All right. So now, and I think like, I know I, I sent that, I sent that, uh, that meme out the other day. Oh yeah. Okay. I got you by a few years still. So we're close, but I still got you by a few years. You're not even 40 yet, bro. Relax. Um, <laughs> um, that meme where it's like, I don't know what movie it's from, but it's like Vietnam vets, Guat fence, and the guat that guy, the little he's a little kid, and he's like, "Was it all for nothing?" And then the last picture. Oh right? yeah, 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 right? yeah, and yeah, yeah. So yeah. I mean, <laughs> dude, I, I like I said, you, you've been in ju almost just about right, maybe four or five years less, whatever. But I think my kind of evolution of my take and my feeling on everything, and I think maybe I learned this more talking the grunt. And maybe even more talking to our buddy Lafayette Lee a few times. It's evolved a lot because when you're 22, I, I think I was 20. I was, yeah, I was 22 when I got to Iraq. I turned 23 when I was there. And then being in Afghanistan, I was like 30, 30, 31. And then just where I'm at now, just kind of seeing the evolution of that and how more and more like, the higher you get up, the more you see, the more you're privy to, the more you realize that you're not the dude on the ground anymore. It changes your, your outlook and your perspective. It changes, at least for me, and you could totally have a different experience, which is why I want to get your take on it. Um, Cause I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't live in that world and I don't operate in that world, but <clears throat> I feel like that memes fucking, I mean, I know we, we, we make fun of it cause that's what we do, but at the yeah. same time, it's like, man, that's fucking starting to hit a little bit, especially with so, Joe, right? We can actually talk Joe Kent cause he's running for Congress. He's lived through this shit as well, but even Joe's like, man, the fucking lights on and like, this fucking sucks. And he did some shit. Yeah. It's, it, it's man, it's a lot of things, but I think the, the, I actually have a really interesting anecdote. I don't. I. I. I didn't really share a whole lot initially. So, yeah. uh, I finished the Q course in three months, maybe a little bit sooner after that. Uh, shortly after the Q course. So when I uh, first of all, when I was in hundred first, uh, I saw a lot of my friends get shot and injured. I was really, really fortunate to not have any guys that I had served <laughs> with die on that rotation. Mm -hmm. Let me take that back. I had friends that served with me that died, but they weren't in my platoon or weren't in my company. So I was not directly exposed to guys in my company dying. So, so you, you deployed before you ever went to the Q course? Yeah. So okay. I was in the 101st as an artillery guy. I was okay. attached to an infantry company. And I saw, you know, dudes' asses get uh, shot off from um, RKG grenades. I saw, you know, dudes lose their calves. Um, and I had friends in other uh, units in the 101st while we in my battalion uh there was a really good lieutenant buddy um who was a captain at the time or got promoted to captain in iraq ended up dying in a horrific humvee uh fire uh after they got hit with the rpg um and i we'd had other friends die outside of our battalion um so i was really fortunate i didn't really have yeah. any like you know good buddies die i got to the q course and um within months 
uh, one of my buddies dies in a in third group dies in a firefight uh, shortly thereafter. And I like break down. Yeah. Um, a year later, my land nav buddy in um, the Q course dies in a firefight. He was in 20th group. And then like uh, my, one of my dive school buddies uh, steps on an IED and dies and so like i like it like in this happens while i'm active almost every year like it's like a fucking it was like a curse for a while and uh so i i you know as i was getting out uh i I, like sat down and had a really long conversation with my dad about it and um and he had kind of a bad anecdote which was kind of a good anecdote at the time and it's like it's all fucking bicycle riding you know you're all you're spinning your wheels right yeah and like you are you're in war and you're doing these things and you're spinning your wheels feeling like you're going nowhere. And then bike riding, you know, especially racing, like, you know, you're going in a circle, you're not fucking going anywhere. But when you get off that bike or whenever you stop doing that thing where you feel like it, it's made you stronger, right? Whether it's, whether it's, whether it was, whether it was your intended effect or not, Um, the only thing that allows you to walk away, whether you win that race or lose that race, it's put you in a position to be stronger. And then at the end of the day, you know, whether you decide to keep racing or whether you say fuck this or whatever is entirely up to you, but you, you can either allow it to kind of affect you negatively and, um, you know, kind of like haunt you, or you can realize what it was for what it was and kind of move on. And so like, yeah, man, it was definitely all like, <laughs> it was all for not. It's in, especially the not like the way I feel about it too, is there's like the soft world and then there's the non soft world. And right. you look at, you know, when I was in, when I was in Iraq for 15 months, we changed the area that we were in drastically. And then when we left, it went right back to the shithole. And was, that's what grunt you know, basically related you know, the same and, thing, man. Like, there's no continuity. You, no, and not even in, in there's, you know, from a tactical level, we, there were a bunch of things we could have said we would have fixed. Um, and m- maybe, maybe the changes that we would have thought would have fixed it would have, or maybe they wouldn't have, you know, so that th- from the regular, like a regular line GWAT vet, like I totally understand and sympathize there for their frustration because it was like, you know, for real, real, uh, it, it does seem like a lot of their friends' sacrifices were in vain. I think especially given kind of the context of how we left Iraq and Afghanistan, yeah. you know, in, in, the, in, in previous history. From the soft perspective, it becomes a lot more fluid, and it's also kind of what you make it. Like, the work that you do um, will probably be negated by whoever you, whoever you replace, and maybe it won't. Um, mm. but the relationships you make and the, the work that you do is entirely driven by you. And so like when you're on a line unit, you're just going out in a Humvee to do a presence patrol because you got told to in special operations, <laughs> you get to mold that area because you want to. Right. And so like, if you want to go out and kill bad guys all the time and do Intel driven hits, you can do that. If you want to go and build rapport and attend Shuras and like try and, you know, bring about social change within your area, you can. And so like, you kind of have a little bit of responsibility as an SF dude or as a dude in special operations for like, you know, that one time you were there, but it still doesn't change the overall scheme of like, when you leave, you know, it does go back down the crapper or whatever else. So, and the nice part is, is we get the opportunity to go outside of the GWAT and look at other countries and have those effects. And so like, man, what I did in Africa was a hundred percent worth it. And it is still reaping benefits to the guys that are going over there. And so it's like, man, you know, like being in this part of the military is cool. Cause when you do step outside the GWAT, you do get, you know, you do see strategic and global changes that are like improving uh, the quality of life for people abroad. But, um, you know, Afghanistan and Iraq, because they were, <laughs> they were so long, and so drawn out. And the way that it was ended was done in the way that it was supposed that, you know, that, that it wasn't supposed to be. And just kind of seeing the, you know, the, was it worth it? It's like, man, you know, it's, I, that does hit home. And I do feel, yeah. I do, I do tend to agree with that. I think, especially just given the the circumstances. So but. I asked, uh, I asked grandpa this question because it came up kind of in throughout his stories. And he's, he's telling a very similar story to what you did in terms of how you, Hey, we, we affected this change in our, in our AO. And then when it was time to leave it, 
probably turned into something different. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I bring this up because let's go back to what, let's go back to world war two, right? When those guys left, they left, they came back when it was fucking done and it was years. So do you think there's a benefit to the, like the rotation method that we employ today? Where it's like you, you mentioned like when we started out in OIF one, right? Like, like I remember, and this is me not doing what you did, but I remember like, I remember going in for the invasion and we were told very specifically, yeah, we'll be home before Christmas. Mm-hmm. And then that turned into four extensions and we were there 16 months. But Oof. then you talk about your first deployment, right? With one of the 101st, you were there for 15 months. Right. And then it started to slowly back down to 12. And now we're at this point where it's nine. Um, but what do you think about if we do decide to ever go somewhere again and we, we open up a theater of fucking operations and, and we're doing this shit, whoever goes and I get it, you need to bring in new people from time to time, but whoever's there, you're fucking there. You're there until it's done. Like you're there indefinitely. There's no, there's no changeover that way. It's like, oh, well, cause we saw this, right? Like Netflix even made a fucking mockery of it with the fucking Brad Pitt movie where here we are. And they're kind of loosely depicting McChrystal, but it's a, it, there's a very good point where every four star that comes in on their nine month rotation is like, nah, now it's my turn. Hold my beer. Watch this. But that filters all the way down to every unit that rotates in. It's like, now it's our turn. Watch what we do. So there's no continuity. There's no building or expounding upon what work is done prior. So do you think there's a benefit to just, if you go in somewhere, you're there until it's done? Yeah. I mean, I, to your point, like Vietnam wasn't much different because guys had tours right. and they did rotations in Vietnam. Yeah. I think, I think honestly, there, I don't know what the right term would be, but it's what we've made out of war that has done it right. And so we've made a, like i really don't know what the word is but it's like this participatory opportunity where you go there for six months and then you go back and then maybe you go to a different area and i don't know if like because originally third group and a lot of other groups were like well i just want to go back to the same area that i was in so i can continue continue to affect change and so it was like you know let's have these two odas or these three teams whatever rotate in and out of marja or Paktika or whatever, and we own it. And so these three, basically three teams are the guys that go there and do that. And it's like, that's a really good idea for like individual special operations teams. Yeah. And I know, you know, even the groups like soft was getting super burned out because we just, we were all spread so thin. And initially, uh, you know, I think the army is thinking about regionally aligning uh, divisions as well and so like you know let's say the 101st gets iraq and the 82nd gets mm-hmm. afghanistan and then you have guys rotate in and out and they go back there the problem is is that even though it looks cool on paper all of your command structure and everything else p pcs is every four years yeah. so there's going to be a loss of a whole bunch of information when dudes pcs and nobody ever is pcs aligned to the point where like they all do it at the same time and so your S3 who knew the area really, really well that you were your units going back to just PCS six months before your train up, right? Or your battalion commander is not going to be your battalion commander for this time that they're going to go back. And so there's a lot of credence to the concept of like you stay till you fight. The scary part though is I don't think we have the um I don't think we have the uh, like the representation i don't i i don't i feel like nobody would care if that was the case right yeah. like the way i feel is in world war ii is like everybody was involved and so yep. everybody wanted to finish get this war over with and get their sons and daughters homes and they put the pressure on people mm-hmm. to get it done vietnam uh was kind of the same way but you know, the reason why there was pressure on to get out of Vietnam is because there are also a significant amount of human rights violations. And this was the first time war was on TV. And so it made it unique. Yeah. You know, we kind of were like, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, whatever. You know, after the first few years, it was like, you know, thank you for your service. And yeah, everybody, was, you know, everybody kind of lost of sight of it. And so yeah. if we do have a war where everybody stays until it's done, uh, my worry is we basically just write off that that number of people within our generation. Right. And they, they're, they're lost to the ether of trauma and, 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 and so, and social interaction. Right. And who knows four years, five years after these kids come back, maybe they're completely different people or, 
maybe staying there until the war is done puts enough pressure on politicians to actually make a sound decision, have a tactical plan, have a strategic plan, and then execute it. And if it fails or succeeds, everybody's coming back home after two years or whatever. Well, that's so my worry is, yeah, my worry is like politicians, nobody, nobody's putting screws to politicians in, in a campaign like that, where we do have to say that it would, you know, that, that they would do anything about it. Well, so that was my thing. Like, that was kind of the thing that like, that was the byline when I posted the shit with grandpa. I was like, cause one of the things he said was we went to a, we went to war. America didn't. Mm-hmm. Right. So it, it kind of talked it, that ties into exactly what you said. Like, you know, man, nine 11 was a, was a, a, a huge unifying event. It's the only reason I joined. I dropped out of fucking college to join because of nine 11, but that was so fleeting, man. Like, and if you think, dude, that was 20 years ago. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, I was actually the, thinking about that today. Twenty well, years ago, on the twenty-first year, like that's not that long ago. Like it is, no. but it's not. But at the same time, it's like, how far have we devolved? We haven't evolved. How far have we devolved in twenty-one years, considering where we were then? Like the unification that came out of that, and and I don't know. Like we could go back, and I know, like let me. I don't want it to make it seem like I'm I'm nullifying my original point. Was like, man, was it all for nothing? Because I feel like. I don't know if we could replicate that moment where everyone was unified and just willing to just go along with whatever. Like you had Colin Powell, like literally the most trusted military general on the fucking planet goes before the UN and ultimately lied. Mm-hmm. Right. Like he ultimately, oh, yeah. Like, yeah, look at the, like, Check yeah, that wasn't out. true. Right. But like, that was like that, that happened. Like we, we were so unified for about a year and maybe, well, maybe two and a half years after 9-11 and then it just all turned back into politics and now we look at where we're at in 2022 and it's just like man what does it take to get us back to that point where we we were at that precipice of patriotism and unification yeah honestly uh who was i talking to about this maybe it was my dad um we maybe it is on here get your dad because yeah, right. my... <laughs> we were basically talking about how like you know 9 11 was a unifying moment but it was a unifying moment because everybody got attacked right yeah it wasn't like it was a you know a school shooting or something where we we our argument was going to be predicated on the use of a tool it was you know dudes fucking attacked america and we were not happy because regardless of what happens is like you don't you know, you don't attack Americans. Uh, We attack ourselves. And so like, that's what unified us. I think, I think though, um, there was a lot of patriotism and we saw a lot of people in the military sign up and they all wanted to go, but we didn't have this, like, it wasn't like, all right, guys, we're at war with this greater evil. Uh, We need everybody to sign up. It was like, we can do this. We've got this. America will, you know, we'll, we'll, we will take your sons and daughters that want to volunteer to serve, but we'll, we'll make sure that something is done to, you know, get exact our revenge. And then it kind of exploded into like, Hey, let's, you know, let's go to Iraq. Let's go and do these things. So like it, like it, it, it went from meaning well to a complete shit show. And then, once we got bought into everything, right? Once we stayed in Afghanistan and stayed in Iraq, it was like, oh man, what are we doing here, right? Because our original intent was like, hey, let's go kill bad guys that did bad things to us. Yeah. And then it turned into like, we want to give them freedom. And I was, and when I was in the army, I was like, why are we, like, what? We are not a nation building organization. Like, I am literally an artilleryman with a, you know, a 105 millimeter house. Or my, like, I'm not building cities. I'm literally trained to level them you know with the help of the infantry and armor dudes like i'm not supposed to be helping you know build these fucking cities and so it was like the military became increasingly disenfranchised with the with the job that they were doing because they became you know really nothing more than a police force the only guys that got to do anything that we you know we would have considered remotely fun were soft and then it just kind of went to like well you know let's just keep it keep everything from collapsing Right. In Afghanistan, it was literally like, okay, well, it is collapsing, but we did what we could so we can leave with our heads held high. And then as everything was collapsing, it was like, you know, it was this was a nightmare. nightmare. So it's it, 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 you know, it's 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 hard because we veterans view the GWAT as this holistic participation thing, when in reality, it's like. You know, you look at what you did and you should be proud in what you did if what you did was, you know, worth being proud for. Um, 
there's plenty of people, you know, that were in leadership positions that completely screwed you over. And it's not any different now than it was, you know, in the, what, from the revolutionary war, you know, it's, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why I bring it up though, because it's like, I, I go back to the continuity piece, like the last, I mean, I know there's other examples, but the only thing that I think most people who at least took a fucking basic world history course could could kind of equate it to was like the Peloponnesian War was 27 years, man. Yeah. Like that was 431 to like, I don't know, four something BC. Like it was about 26, 27 years, whatever, from what I vaguely remember. And I'm like, that's what I'm thinking about. Because I think like, if you go back and read just world history and the war, like they were fucked, they took forever. And I always remember reading like, what the fuck were they doing? And now I know. Now I honestly know because I don't think it's very, I don't honestly, bro, I don't think it's much different. We spent 20 years in Afghanistan and like you could go back and look like I go back and look, I reflect on my time there and I know what it was. I know exactly what operation it was for. I know exactly our purpose, but I'm like, wait a minute, man. Like that was 10 years almost prior to what, like the end, like the ultimate, the ending. I'm just like, man, it, have we always been this inefficient when it comes to fucking war? Like everybody, not just not well, just the, ir- the irony behind it too <laughs> is the irony behind the Peloponnesian war. Like nobody came, nobody really came out ahead on it. Yeah. Like, like well, how's that any different? Right. Did come it, out ahead on the block? Right? No. Like, like, like Sparta it's like, it, like, what was it? Like Sparta took over the Athenian empire. Uh, like, 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 like took all of its revenue as a ways of me of taking recompense from like this war yeah. and it was like still like even though they made like greater sacrifices part of still got pretty much dick like they broke even right and like imagine like you know I losing think. i feel like we're gonna be a fucking we're gonna be a footnote that you and i like there's gonna be some dude in a thousand years doing a whatever version of the podcast same thing a thousand years and they'd be like man those fucking idiot americans they would they spent 20 years in afghanistan for fucking what well, so the yeah. so that's the that is the interesting thing is I do so the G the G watts like output is not what everybody thinks the G watts output is right. It's like you go to Afghanistan, you kill bad guys, and you come back like you know a hero or whatever, or like you make Afghanistan a safer place, or America wins or whatever. What the G watt has done is it has made a generation of extremely uh, yeah. knowledgeable and proficient. I don't know if the term is warriors or whatever, but you basically have ba- you've basically taken all of the desert storm yep. military isms that didn't work. You've pushed you basically have pushed warfare through probably one of the more elite filters. And what has come out of this filter is your basic eleven series, when you look at like guys like Grunt, are right. far more knowledgeable, um, tactically capable and uh like and intelligent than even dudes that weren't in the GWAT in the, in the, in the nineties. Right. And so you, you, there's like a quantum leap in knowledge and information that these guys have. And, and like, there's always the conversation that this like new woke military, which in some senses is a thing um, is going to, is going to have us lose to like a peer army and like so afghanistan and iraq are definitely a footnote in that like we lost to an insurgency and there's not very many insurgencies that larger standing nations have won however um if we were to go to war with a peer like russia or china the i'm and and the and the tactics of warfare aren't, aren't any different than what we would see in world war ii um i would say we are at least one generation ahead of uh how we would fight when it comes to our knowledge base right and so if you look at like how an 11 series dude from the 82nd would fight in comparison to a russian or chinese 11 series or their infantrymen it is significantly different even when we look at peer countries that are our allies like france like i've seen it they are they are a level below in terms of like what your you know your average fighting force has that 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 doesn't speak to like well, what, supply I mean, trains I think, and whatever else yeah, but i think you're basing that off of like and, and correct me if i'm wrong but i think you're basing that off of like what technology available tactics but what about the, what about the the unaccounted for i think variable which is the just the adherence to fucking violence and brutality like do, do, like we're so afraid of being that 
I think. Uh, I th- with so, rules of engagement, and th- like, do you think fucking China gives a fuck? No, no, no. So, and 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 my point is like, if we go to war with China, then the expectation is we're fighting war like war, right? Like it's like World War Three or World War Two, right? So, the, so the rules we, of it. Like, the, I get where you're saying, but do you really think that we would try to carry it out that way? I, it's I don't know if we have a choice. Like I genuinely yeah. and 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 the real thing is like you don't have command and control like you yeah. would in GWAT, right? You're not oh. going back to a fob. You're in a patrol base, and when you get attacked, you're like, "Well, is this within the rules of engagement?" You're like, "Bro, <laughs> we're we're in a triangle. We we have a belt fed. We have to defend ourselves." So like, I th- like, I think so. I don't like I don't know so. But if if we did, if we got put in that position, right, and if we fought a war uh like a war should be fought then i don't think it would be an issue but we, like like us like i kind of said like we are our own worst enemy what will end yeah. up happening is we're killing bureaucracy inside, yeah man bureaucracy would be its own issue um and so that, that's a, that's a whole other thing with that said though like what we've ended up pumping out is when dudes get out of the military they they are civilians that are significantly more knowledgeable about the bureaucracy of the military and, and larger government. Yeah, and honestly, are- I'm I, I I honestly, bro, and I and you may think similar or differently, but I'm curious. Like, I'm I'm honestly I'm more afraid of the veterans at this point than I am of our actual fucking military. <laughs> right, what do you like mean? because what, of what, what you, you mean, just like, said. Like, they oh got, yeah, you got you got dudes with three, four, five, some with six. Like, I went to drill sergeant school with a four dudes who were rangers, and they all served together. They all had six tours in Afghanistan. This was 08. Yeah. So imagine how long they'd been doing that shit. Well, you know? and not only that, but like you, I mean, you, when you look at just the gun community and you see the influx of instructors who like do have credentials and have like you know been in firefights and aren't just a bunch of fuds that shoot well. <laughs> fuds. Um, I, you know, you, I don't know you, where that term came from. Like, <laughs> like Elmer last, Fudd, because all I do is say, "Oh yeah, I think Elmer Fudd." I just think it's funny. It's just and you see yeah. a lot of these guys coming into the community and you, i mean there definitely has been a rise of gun culture or maybe it's just been my exposure to twitter but like yeah. there's definitely a rise in gun culture that has stemmed from the GWAT. but it's typically for the most part it's been a good thing because it's actually educating people on like yeah you know like what like first of all what what is good to buy as opposed to like just what looks cool and then also like how to be a responsible firearm owner and how to like use the tool properly and how to you know kind of be a better person and like i didn't mean to plug braxton in the bunkhouse on this but like there are communities he somehow are, gets mentioned right the <laughs> there are communities there are communities that are being grown that are like driven to helping you know kind of um develop yourself and reconnect or connect with dudes that you know yeah. want to like dudes that want to teach that have things to teach and then people that want to learn so there i think that's been the one benefit is like yeah man there was a lot of shitty shit that happened for 20 years um it had whether it was worth it or not in terms of like the effort like i miss it um it's made me a better person and it's shown me that like you know i needed to get out in order to be a good you know a good father and a good husband yeah um and 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 that's kind of where i like mentally disconnect myself right and it's like if i spend all day thinking about you know was it worth uh losing friends then it then all it does is just kind of forces me to wallow in my own self-pity where do you think like so going back to the gun culture that we're talking about and all um this is a big because this is a big thing for me like my biggest thing is like I just want to be more fit than the next dude. And I know I'm not. So oh, that yeah. makes me, that's a huge motive act, motivation factor for me is it's like, I just want to be fitter than whoever I fucking go up against. And anyway, right. like, that's why I do my stupid little fucking CrossFit competition. That's why I, like, <laughs> I love doing, like, I love competing from a physical standpoint and knowing I'm not, you know, I'm not this fucking, I'm not going to go win the fucking CrossFit games. I'm not an Olympic level fucking lifter. I'm not a world-class power lifter, but I love the fucking, the grind to do that like oh yeah so and i think we've seen a lot of this especially on twitter lately um not just lately but just overall like and a lot of people that run in the fucking goon circle right like we all know goon is kind of this big on encompassing circle there's a lot of people Mm -hmm. right but a lot of these people they're like so in your in your opinion in your words how or what should people be doing from a fitness standpoint? Because you talked about the gun things that you and Grunpa do. 
you know, these gun runs or whatever. Yeah. Like, like there's like, I've, I've seen what you've shown us and I'm like, well, well I bet you, you know what, if the, the fitter you are, the probably easier it is. Right. Yeah. I mean, I got like, second on important. the, I got second Look on the at last you, bro. run. I, I, I placed 12th overall uh, because I skunked one shoot, uh, which is a whole other story. And then I got, <laughs> I got second on the run and that put me on 12th. And like, it's because I've been running in, you know, 90 degree weather with plates on for the last, you know, however many, however many months. Uh, so that's, what's gotten me to get my placing for that. Uh oh, you're peeing. Did I lose him? No, 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 you're good. Oh, there he is. Yeah. So no. I mean, that's 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 my thing. That's what I'm trying to. Do you think, in terms of what you're doing with 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 shooting? Obviously, we know movement, the contact, all that stuff. But the stuff that the average person doesn't do, like a lot of people, they just need to get to the range, get proficient with their weapon, whatever platform it is. But where does the fitness tie in? Do you think like there's a huge? Do you see like? I guess let, let, let's break it down to where you operate in that way. Do you see like a, a, a disconnect between people with various levels of fitness in terms of their performance? Like, Oh yeah. I mean, are. massive. Right. So, yeah. um, I mean, even when you look at like CrossFit, right. If you've got right. dudes that aren't, uh, really proficient in cardio, then they're not going to perform Metcons as well as like other dudes. Right. Yeah. But they may be really good Olympic lifters. And so the funny thing I see is usually I see like, you see specialists trying to do generalist stuff <clears throat> and what you really need to be good at is just being a generalist. And so yeah. like for most people, um, like for most people it's running and you see like really, really good runners, uh, that can't lift 200 pounds on top of their shoulders, or you'll see guys that are Olympic lifters. And then you put them on like a four mile run and they just don't, they don't, you know, they don't survive or whatever. And so you've got to be really good. You've got to be good enough at both to, um, to function. And so for me, like I do, I don't run anything more than like six miles. I don't run every single day. Uh, and I, I, I lift, I try and lift, you know, every other day. Um, and really like it all comes, it's, you know, we, you talk about fitness forever, but like it comes down to diet, uh, and then yeah. intensity and then recovery too. So like, you know, if you're not eating well, that's one puzzle piece in your, you know, your whole pyramid of fitness. That's Probably one of the biggest though, right? For real. Yeah. I also think sleep is a really big one too. Absolutely. And so if you're not getting enough sleep or you can't get enough sleep or your sleep's interrupted, in your though, like, have massive you seen those studies, bro. Oh dude. And I've seen it now. I've got a heart rate monitor that also monitors my sleep. And like, I see a massive dip in my physical performance if I get less than uh, yeah. six hours of sleep. And so like sleep diet, and then intensity of training, um, or, you know, lack thereof, depending on whether you're giving yourself rest days or not is huge. And what it really comes down to is you need to be able to be fast. You have to be able to kind of have explosive strength. You need to be able to, to, to have some endurance. And then you need to have like, um, what is the right term? Like you don't need to be, you don't need, like carrying a weight over your shoulder, like carrying a sand odd bag, object, odd you know, object. like odd, odd object. object is important. Yeah. And then also like you need to be able to hold a rifle for an extended period of time yeah. in the position that you're going to shoot. And it's not like curls isn't going to solve that problem. A lot well, of we've, we've solved calisthenics, it with the ACFT, bro. We have the plank, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's, there's a, like what you really have to do is, and, and I did this, the first gun run was uh, like, I just self-diagnosed and being, being real, like, honestly being real with yourself is a, is a game changer if you can once you learn like to tell yourself you suck uh it'll really help you improve and it's like fuck man my rifle shooting was good my pistol shooting sucked my run time was hot garbage uh and i could carry everything and i was like all right so i'm a little bit too muscle bound i need to start running more and i really need to start doing my pistol drills and then you know uh setting a milestone or like a 
like a metric for yourself in terms of like when you want to change and how you like to see the performance, like kind of almost like counseling yourself on yeah. your personal improvement really does change the game. Um, and then that's what, you know, that's what helped me with my run and has so far helped me with, uh, with pistol shooting. And now it's just a matter of like, <clears throat> you know, seeing where, cause these two match these, this last match where these, uh, the two stages that I basically uh, timed out on, it was like minor stuff that um, I knew what occur while it was occurring was something I shouldn't have been doing. And so there was one time where I was, where you're shooting through a, basically like a VTAC board and I had to have my pistol, my rifle sideways and I was shooting through a porthole and I was shooting a steel target and I didn't see any impact, but I kept shooting the same thing because I was so sure of what my hold was. Mm -hmm. And then, I, and then the guy, I thought he had said hit and he said left and without asking him what he said, I sent three more rounds and then my time was up and it was like, okay, well, what, what did I fuck up? And it's like, well, I kind of fucked everything up, but <laughs> you know, what I should have done was I should have actually taken the time to see the reaction. If the still didn't react and I, then I should have just erased what my, what I thought my dope was and thought about, you know, conceptually where I should be aiming at this target and hitting. And then as I heard something, I should have confirmed it. Like I'd been doing, you know, on long range courses since time in memoriam, when someone says hit, you're like, okay, I hear you said hit. And then he confirms. And it was like, no, no, no. I just thought I heard him say hit. And so I sent it. So, you know, being able to do that and then um, you know, realize where your faults are when it comes to those types of competitions or where your fitness is. Yeah. Like, but like fitness and shooting should go hand in hand. Like if you're really taking, uh, you know, being a protector or be thinking about defending yourself or being a competitor seriously, uh, you can't take fitness out of the equation. Right. And so what you're describing, I think, because I don't want people to be like, oh, well, I mean, it because because someone could pick apart everything you just said, right? Like if, if someone's a dick, they could pick it apart. Sure. But what you're describing is you're, you're describing sport, right? Like oh, hundred percent. This is, this is sport for you. This is a sport for you. However, let's, let's qualify it with the fact that you don't just do this for fucking sport. Like you actually do this shit for fucking real when it's time and you're called on. Like, this is like a real thing for you. Yeah. So there could be someone who's better in this version of sport but they can't go fucking do what you go do or what your guys do. Right. So that's why I guess my question to you is when it comes to this, do you see the value in training for it? But also do you see, like, do you, do you have like your own specific training plan for your dudes that incorporates any of this, or is this kind of just something you do for fun? Oh, I mean, this is, so the sport itself helps train me for yeah. the activity too. So right. I, I mean, these running guns are a lot of fun because I genuinely love it. But and it and also, honestly looks fucking, every time I see you and grunt or grunt, especially post something I'm like, man, that looks fucking fun. I'd probably it, suck at it, but I could run. And it, <laughs> and it, but it also prepares you for. Probably can't do that shit in California either. So Cause the stages are scenario based too. Right. And so you're, you're working with a buddy in some senses or you're working alone That's pretty cool, man. and you're shooting in awkward positions. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I, I just came back from a special forces advanced urban combat course and the, mm -hmm. the translation from what I did at a, at that school to a run gun are pretty similar. That's the cool. techniques of clearing corners and, you know, going through the threshold and doing it with four other guys is obviously not, you know, it's not even there for a run and gun, but like your ability to lift a weight and engage a target yeah. um, is there your, your ability to accurately pick up and discriminate targets is there and your necessity, just the fitness necessity in general is there, right? Cause when you're going from room to room and house to house, you have to be able to get back out of that lactic threshold, kind of, kind of reconsolidate yourself and then go back into it. And so like, yeah, I mean, being able to run a 5k and then shoot while you're running the 5k and accurately hit your targets totally translates to, you know, uh, what you, what I, what I do and what a lot of dudes do in the military. Yeah. And like the, there are definitely different ways to train, like, you know, carrying heavy ass stuff and doing ruck marches is usually not what civilians do to train for gun runs. It does help, but like that's kind of specialized as well. But, um, you know, you can do some of that stuff in the army because you're training for like a specific thing or like log and rifle PT or, 
you know, plate carrier run drills or whatever have you, right? It conditions your body to get used to certain things under stress uh, a little bit quicker than it would to just, you know, yeah. run five miles for a 5k. Um, but realistically, like it's quite honestly, no different from what I've, from what I've seen, um, fitness is fitness, whether it is in sport or combat and your biological, you know, recovery and feedback typically is the same. And the nice part is, fitness puts you at a basic level for stress response. And so even if you have a really bad stress response to trauma, your ability to recover from it physically, right? Your heart rate and everything else is going to be, it will be markedly better, the better, the the more in shape you are, right? So right. as your heart rate increases, as you're freaking the fuck out of being shot at, <laughs> everything goes back down at a much more efficient level yeah. because you've been running or because you've been lifting. Whereas like, you know, if you're sleeping and eating shitty and you don't work out and then you get shot at, and then you're thinking about 50 different things, you know, you're, you become a lot more mentally and physically overwhelmed if you're not fit. And that's what I think, like, this may be kind of one of our biggest this might go back to what you were saying. I don't even know how you could test it, but I think it's, it's kind of, it, it could probably be a pretty good variable in my opinion is that this might be one of the things that is the separator between, you know, any type of engagement we had with the Taliban, with ISIS, if we were going to play it out, like with, with, with fucking China or Russia, like I think our level of fitness when it comes to guys like yourself and in these, these special I don't know, like these these super focused areas of fucking combat with dudes who actually take the level of fitness serious as well. That component, that might be the separator, right? Because you could take you could go back and think like, oh, all right, there's a every every fucking army has infantry, but you and I, we've seen the some of the world's militaries. Like some of these fucking people, you're like, you're in the military, okay, cool, <laughs> right? Like you could see that, but oh, yeah, but it, it goes back to what you said, like when when you find yourself in a fi a firefight that that's a there's a lot of shit that comes into play and who's going to actually survive that yeah and yeah. it's it's um there's a in i think you said it but there's there is a lot of things at play and it's um fitness is definitely like a discriminator and it's not even what's really funny is like you go to south america and a lot of south american special operations can run really really well like they yeah. run you know circles around regular sf dudes mm -hmm. but they can't lift a lot of weight or they can't like it's yeah. so their fitness is very specialized and i think right. what we also have that i would say the good majority of most other countries don't have with the exception of fellow western countries like maybe you know the uk and maybe australia and canada uh france kind of yeah has i was gonna say it. france france they do a lot of fucking fitness man and they're, what they're, i saw in afghanistan those guys were it's all fucking it's a something. mixture of their fitness um their kind of weapons proficiency and then also what it really comes down to and, and i'm uh, is the nco core <clears throat> and it's you know if you look at iraq the Iraqi NCO Corps was actually officers. Uh, and if you look at most of what we're kind of seeing in Russia and China now is, you know, their NCO Corps is officers. And like having a strong NCO Corps um, is, uh, I mean, like is, is a, is what changes the game for us because yeah. you've got dudes that are literally holding everybody's feet to the fire in terms of standards. <laughs> so like, Officers. Well, you brought it up, right? You said to, like yeah. officers shouldn't be doing our job. We should. Right. We, we need NCOs need to make your job as easy as fucking possible. Like that's the whole. It's part of the creed. Officers will not do what I fucking you know, like. And, they will not do my job, right? Because you guys need to do all the other shit, right? And I think what really like when we talk about you know the social or cultural or uh, you know the po po policy issues that the army has. I think it really comes down to a mixture of what standard are we willing to let slide or what standard are we accepting in terms of fitness, which is like, it's one, one problem, one big problem. Yeah. And then also um, what our NCO core is going to look like. Cause I think we're at a turning point now with post global war on terror, where there is NCOs that have, that have participated in the global war on terror that are, um, I mean, like some of them are probably stereotypical hard asses. Some of them understand that, you know, it doesn't matter how many tattoos you have, 
is not what makes you a professional. And then mm -hmm. also, you know, the, a newer NCO core that is probably coming in with a different generation that is viewing these previously deployed combat hardened NCOs as kind of dinosaurs. And I don't think either, either one is right or wrong, but I think what it will do is it's going to determine the quality of NCO and ultimately, you know, the army's quality for the next decade where like, are we going to have, you know, like a French or more European style NCO core where like, you know, you, you're basically just a pay grade up and you're not really a leader or owning anything or, you know, are we going to continue forward with kind of the American concept of the NCO? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good point. And that kind of leads me to the last, like, probably the last topic I'll get your, your take on. Cause we're, um, I respect that the fact that you are not in the right time zone. Um, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is early for me, man. Like, you know, it's late on a Friday night. You're turning up, <laughs> turning up on a podcast. What up? Hell yeah. Um, so the ACFT, right? The Army Combat Fitness Test for those at home who don't know what ACFT means. Um, now, I don't know how this works for you in terms of the shift for the, the soft world or, or any of that stuff. Because I feel like if any group who's probably been doing PT at a level that would translate over to this, I, I would think and assume it's probably you guys. Yeah, yeah. I think that's fair. Uh, yeah. So I, I just think it's, it's, and, and again, it probably comes down to, like you said, like the, the leaders, the NCOs, or even probably at your level with the ODAs, I guess you guys are probably a little more tight knit than most units. So you guys probably all have some sort of fitness plan that's implemented because it just makes sense. Like, I don't, I don't think a lot of people could argue with being in shape, right. In terms of yeah. being effective with how you guys do your stuff. But the SCFT, and I, I bring this up because I want to go back in time. I'm going to give a like a history of Eric here, right? I remember the <laughs> – this is a guy that a lot of people don't really like anymore on Twitter is General Mark Hurtling, right? So General Mark Hurtling, he was the three-star in charge. He was the – the he, he was the deputy or the command – no, he was he was trade out commander. Yeah, he was trade out commander, which is the three-star position. Trade out commander when I was a drill sergeant at Benning, right? So, it, and his whole baby was basically what's led to the ACFT. He wanted to have a combat fitness test and he wanted to have a, a more strenuous APFT. So he wanted to have two PT tests in one year, right? You would have the fitness, the combat test, and then you would have the standard one. And so we've been kind of leading to this ACFT for probably the last 14 years, which is my biggest issue with the military in general, or if, even if it's government, like we don't do anything quickly. Right. Mm -mm. <laughs> so I will give general hurtling credit, but I will also take it immediately away because at the same time, it, this study was implemented. And I think in 2010, he was like, Oh, we're doing away with it. So they spent all this time researching it and doing away. And then it, it, he did away with it. He retired. Somebody picked it back up, and yep. I don't know, this is your world, bro. You're you're in that O land. So some O up came in and picked it up and, and ran with back in it. And now we have the ACFT, and it's it's gone under four iterations since 2018. And here we are today, where we have you know age standards and all. But anyway, I just want to bring it back to the ACFT, the Army Combat Fitness Test. We're, <laughs> in its in its current form, what what is your take on it? Like, do you think it's an improvement oh, I, from I where so. we were, or like with the eight with the 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 standard three event APF? So, like, I mean, oh. anything is an, an improvement yes. from push up, sit ups, and a run. <laughs> um, but the 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 frustrating part was the sequence of like d like d evolution that it had like when they yeah. first released it it was like bro the we're gonna quality. do a deadlift we're gonna do yep. a sprint drag carry we're gonna have leg tucks we're gonna do some hand release push-ups and um and, and like and so like well i heard that i was like oh fuck yeah and the other thing they were gonna do is they were gonna make it age um age blind and yep. gender blind and so mm -hmm. it was gonna be like look man if you pass you pass if, if you can pass it, then this is our certification that you are combat capable, that you're able to do a job. And I was like, that's a great idea because this is exactly what we should be – should be a metric for your fitness for combat, right? It's the yep. combat fitness test. Um, 
and then uh, I forgot what it turned into. It was like going to be MOS specific, yeah, right? Because everybody MOS, was arguing like, oh, three well, tiers. You had yeah. gold, yellow. Well, you had gold, black, and fucking whatever. Yeah, it was so something. It was and, three and, tiers. And, yeah. and, and, and I still got on that because it was like, okay, fair enough. There's some combat right. MOS. Made sense. Yeah, the minimum, sense. even the minimum wasn't like the, the windows or the, the, the windows of it weren't that different. And so like, you know, if you're an 18 series, you can see how a, a non-combat MOS performed and it was still within like an ex what seemed like a reasonably mm -hmm. acceptable metric. Um, and what got, and what made me laugh and what I really started to laugh at was like the whole, like after that happened, the whole crying about leg tucks where um, everybody was basically saying like, uh, you know, I previously had a C-section or I had children. It, this made it extremely painful. This is what I had to do, right? And it was, what frustrated me was like, uh, I had family that was in the military that had had children uh, that was ha was going through the pain and was and was literally doing exactly what you were supposed to do after you have children. It's called physical fucking therapy. You go to physical therapy, you you get a uh, a profile, and then after your physical therapy, you take a PT test and you pass it because you do what you're supposed to. You don't just fucking cry about not taking a PT test because you got the owies. Like go get it handled or perform. Like that's literally how the army should be. If you're broken, get fixed if you're not broken and you're yep. not meeting the standard then well, you sh then you should be uh you should be you know you should have a remedial opportunity to get yourself right and if you fuck up again then there will be consequences and it was like having people whine about how this was so gender bias it was like no no no, no. you're just literally physically weak there are men that are like because the funny thing is too it's I, I, i'm gonna be an asshole it typically came from women who weighed in between the weight of 90 pounds and 140, whatever, right? Like, the, like it's a pretty big window of 50 yeah. pounds. But any dude that weighs that much can do pull-ups till the fucking cows come home because right. – they'd have no way to pull, nothing. right? And they're pulling, the, they're all they're doing. So it's like, I don't want to hear about how as a female, you don't, you, you literally have just not trained upper body and you are not familiar with the effort it takes to build upper body strength. And so yeah. you just feel like you shouldn't have to. Like that was the big vibe I got. And so when they changed, when they put in gender standards and they put in age standards and then you saw how the standards were literally like, if you're a 60 year old man, your maximum is, or your, what is it? Like it was some out, outlandish thing where basically. No, 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 you're right. No. So for the 62 and up age group between the 27 and 31 age group for females, men yeah. and women. It's the, the minimum for the males is the max for the females. for the females. And so basically what you're saying is like as a female <laughs> that's supposed to be in her physical prime, you're right, right. You're only supposed to perform like a 60 year old male. And it's like, get no, the fuck out of here. No. And so that's that that's what I bring it back to, because like I said, I just recently did I just did a, the, the ACFT in our company for fucking. Well, it, it will serve as a record because I'm going to take my score. But. Between my time last year when I went to the a the NCOIC like the certification course, when there was it was all hey gender neutral age it was all yeah. the same, because they brought back the age standard, I literally improved forty points. <laughs> like I did a five fifty seven right, and like all I got to do to get a ninety in every event, I just got to work on my fucking the fucking the power you whatever you throw the ball over your head. Well, I'm like, the, I don't work at it. I just go out and do it. Like, so if I just practice that, then right. I'm great. But yeah, like a year before. I mean, that's a four And the argument years. I have too is that, <laughs> like, you shouldn't, there should be no gender standard. There should be no age uh, standard. Just fucking go it's do a, it. Just go It's a combat it. fitness test. Like, yes. you, like, there's no, there's no such thing as like 60 years and older combat. There's no yep. female combat. Yeah. Like, just get rid of the C. Just make it the yeah. AFT because it's no longer the combat test. Right. Yeah, I'm, if they called the AFT, I'd actually be impressed. Be like, "Well done, Army. You've at least been honest with yeah, what your intention is." You acknowledged is, and what I you can, were, yeah, yep. I can accept that. But like, the funny part is, you read the history of it, and you're like, "Oh man, they're just unhappy with these metrics. So we're just going to change the metrics." And like, 
that is probably the best microcosm example of what the global, like I'm leading it back to global war and terror of what the global war and terror was. We mm -hmm. didn't like the output. And so we just changed our expectation of what we wanted it to be. And so like officers call it the measure of effectiveness and the measure of performance, the mo and the mop. Like we saw, <laughs> we saw what the, what the, the performance was. And we're like, we're just going to change what our overall end state was. So it meets. And so we can say it was successful without having to like show the mission failure. That's what's happened with the, the ACFT is we basically been like, Oh man, we don't like the fact that you women know can't what, do you know what, dude, like, here's my issue. Like, this is what goes back because I know it's anecdotal, but I got two anecdotes. The first one. And, and she's already said, I can say her name Candido. So if you're out here, specialist Candido, who's out there with her fucking masters, who decided to join the army reserve had a kid, right? She's 24 when she joined, turned 25 while she was in basic training. Had a kid, C-section, like you this, this, like you described. Super small. Like, she's a small woman, right? Like, 5'4", just super thin. Maybe 120 pounds. <laughs> when she, sh like, I brought her to the office every week for a month and a half before she shipped to try to get her, like, at least familiar with the leg tuck, right? Because that was still a part of it. Yeah. She could barely get her fucking knees to her waist, Forget trying to tuck and actually touch the elbows and get a rep. Couldn't do it. Well, anyway, she comes back two months ago. She's like, yo, Sergeant Ski, I, I was able to get two fucking leg tucks by the time I graduated AIT. I'm like, holy fuck, that's fucking awesome. Right. Not only did you pass, but the way the standard is now, like you're literally 100% over what the pass rate was. Right? <laughs> You've doubled. Right, because she was she's 27 Delta. She's a paralegal assistant. She's in fucking JAG. That's what she's going to do. She's going to chill out in JAG for the rest of her life as a smarty. But she worked her, she worked to do that, right? And then my second yeah. example, now that, now that doesn't even matter because she doesn't have to do that anymore. Now she has to stand there and fucking plank, which I told you, I planked for three minutes. Like, what am I doing? Right. Once the bare minimum at my age group is a minute and a half, or no, a minute and ten. I think for most younger is a minute and thirty. But anyway, you did a minute, that on one arm. Yeah, like come on, man. Like I did it for three minutes, and I like I had this dude Sergeant Hall next to me who's like ten years younger, and he was gonna max it. I'm like, all right, you go max. I'm gonna just try and keep up with you. So that's the only reason I did it for three fucking minutes. So what do you do for three minutes where you just sit there? Anyway, I'm ranting. Anyway, so my <laughs> other anecdotal person is. When I went to this NCOIC ACFT certification course last year at Fort Lee, literally a year ago, I remember this chick, all she wanted to do, like her ultimate goal is to be a drill sergeant. So we hit it off there because I was like, all right, I can point you in the direction. I got a bunch of people that can mentor you. But she told me her personal story. When the ACFT came out in 2018, she literally couldn't do one leg tuck. And she's another chick. Like she was fucking E6, probably like, five six maybe a buck 30 like she's thin like she's a thin but obviously an in shape female right couldn't do a leg tuck at the time when it came out when it was time to go over all the events she was the one who demonstrated the leg tuck she did 20 like it was nothing holy shit yeah dude the mess the best i the best the most leg tucks i ever did was at this event i did 16 i'm, I'm not gonna pretend that i could max the fucking leg tuck she did 20 like it was nothing and dropped down, probably could have got 30. Nice. Like it wasn't hard for her to do 20, but she worked her fucking ass off to do it. And my whole point with these anecdotal stories is if you demand your soldiers or the army demands its soldiers to do something, I promise you they'll do it. Yep. But if you prevent them from it because you take it away from them because you say it's too hard for whatever group, then what do you expect the response to be? Yeah, and you're just making institutional weakness. That's what it is. Yes. is it's it, it, like, how do I put it? Like, if you are a good NCO, you can be a good NCO by being a hard ass if mm -hmm. you do it right. And 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 guys will and guys and women will respect you more in your organization if you hold them to a standard, as opposed to just if you fucking let shit slide. You're gonna mm -hmm. get. You'll end up getting walked over eventually. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's the same thing with you know like. Uh, policy quite honestly and it's like yeah, we, that's how the acft know. now is, is it's like is it taken seriously it's i don't know like everybody wants to do well on it because they they don't want to fail a pt test at least the organization that i'm in um uh but like it, it it's one of those things where like it doesn't ha carry the weight that it 
used to, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it used to be like, oh man, there's this new test coming out and it's going to be hard. And now it's like, now it's this, there's this new test out and it's going to be, you know, like basically just like another PT test with a little extra few events. Well, that's my biggest thing is I, well, from what I watched in my own unit's experience is like the plank is the biggest example. Yeah. It, it goes back to, and I hate it. I always hated this man. Like, and I get it because it wasn't really a part of promotion. Maybe officers, you could probably lend a different perspective. Cause I don't know, but I just go from mine. Like when dudes would do the bare minimum and the, and the push up or the sit up and they'd get up and they'd have like a minute and a half left. You know, and like, cause yeah. they're two minutes and they, they're already hitting. So what I'm seeing with the ACFT is it's the plank. If it's a minute and 10 seconds for a dude who's like 28 years old, there's these, there, there's dudes doing a minute and 10 seconds and they just get up. Cause it's not hard. Dang. So what's the point? Like, yeah. so that guy has to do a minute and 10 for the minimum, get 60 points or he has to sit there for three and a half minutes to get a hundred. You know, like you're, you're not incentivizing him to do more. But at the same time, he shouldn't have to be incentivized. He should be incentivized by trying to do his maximum fucking physical performance. And well, and I, th not I think everybody has because, that. I right? think it's because the plank just seems so arbitrary. It doesn't you know what make I mean? Any sense? Dude. Like, the, like, like the deadlift. I told you, you like, can... I remember some dude tried to tell me, "Well, the combat application is laying in the prone." I'm like, "Really? You lay in the prone in the plank? Okay, seriously, who who does that?" And like that's the thing is like even even when you look at the PT test in terms of like if it were a competition, dudes would come back about hey man how many push ups you get oh I got yeah you know sixty five I got seventy it's like I got a hundred like you have a goal to meet I always want to do a hundred push ups a hundred sit ups and then run you know a six thirty interval on my even on the easy on the PT test yeah I, I was and it's like deadlift like we you know what 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 deadlift numbers are you putting up what's your sprint drag carry right like sprint drag carry is actually really fun because yeah, it feels those are the, like yeah, a you relay compete race. against each other right yeah. And then, you know, hand release push ups, it's like push ups, whatever. I pain I I think hand release push ups are stupid for like a measurement of uh pec fitness, but that's really? beside the point. Yeah, I would rather just do regular push ups. I just think the only reason I would disagree with you is I think the regular push up has been so gamed into making people think that's fair. really right. You know what I mean? Like the hand yeah. you can't fake a hand release push up. No, that's that, that's a that's a fair point. I never thought about it that way. Yeah. Um, and then the ball throw is the ball throw is just like a shot put to me where it's like, how far can you get, you know, like, well, yeah. and then what does like, and you can see with the, with the, with the power, you like your kinetic <laughs> linkage, your, your kinetic yeet. linkage, like where your legs and your back and your shoulders come into play and being able to like, yeah. you know, link your, link your muscle groups kinetically to throw this thing. And then it's like, oh, by the way, then you just lay in the prone at a funny angle for three minutes. And it's like. Yeah, when we when we when we took the because i not like just keep, like it, they made it the alternate event why not just keep it that way what they should really do is is uh this is how they should do it is they should make it a point of pride they should have said okay you can choose the plank as an alternate event but you can't you'll never you'll basically 60 points no, you'll score but what it'll do is it'll score you on the minimum of everything else so when you do that it basically bottlenecks you for uh let's just say like what what's passing 270 no no 360 so so in other words if no. you maxed everything else nine times nine times six fuck 54 no. six times six 36 yeah 360 there you go so if 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 you maxed everything but instead of the leg tucks you did the plank you're only getting 360 right uh, yeah, yeah yeah no i see what you're saying and so, it was the same thing on our alternate event on the previous one yep and so you should only get the minimum passing amount if you choose you uh a yeah. plank if you do leg tucks then you are in the you're in a whole other world of you know fitness challenges and you can do your high fives and whatever yep. else but like that's what it should have been it should have been like look if, well, you, I, if you i was i was totally cool with it bro if they made the the the, the plank was an alternate event and i like yeah. where you're going with it if you choose to do the plank this is what you ultimately do to your rest of your score but yep. at the same time if you want to compete to have the highest score possible the leg tuck is an option and because i think what, what like, and yeah. really that that's what it should do is it should differentiate the dudes who want to do the fucking bare minimum who you yeah. can see and a then mile what, is away. That, what does that do for you like right because we're right? so afraid of actually highlighting the people who want to be competitive when it comes to promotion now you just gave it you just gave it a perfect fucking 
microscope on the people who actually want to take on the next step to be competitive for promotion. Well, and the you best literally thing- just done away with people who don't. They don't want to be competitive. So now you just you created a pool of people who literally you can say like, yo, these people are the ones who really want this next fucking yeah. position. Well, not only that, but it create it, like the best the best medicine for performance is shit talking peers. Yeah. And so like <laughs> if there's another officer that's like running his mouth, it'd be like, hey, bro, do you do your do you do the leg tuck or do you do the plank? And I was like, maybe next time you'll do a leg tuck and actually score above, you know, whatever your yeah. minimum is. Right. And the same thing with enlisted guys. Like if you have junior enlisted talking shit, they're going to be like, Dude, that's or, all our was right? last week. That's all it was. And like, or, that was even funnier. It was like during the plank, it's like, people are talking shit. It's like, well, what's going to fuck you up the most laughing while you're doing a plank. Right. And, like- a, and, a, and imagine <laughs> being an NCO, imagine being an NCO, and not doing the leg tuck now, right? And now your oh. plank is only going to get you to 360. And then you've got enlisted guys that are outperforming you, blowing you out of the water with your score because you're only doing the the leg, the, yeah. the plank, right? And it's but, like, I mean, bro, your E4 is going to be like, hey, sorry, how'd you do? And you're just going to run yes. the fuck away, right? Like you would if you scored poorly on a run on the PT test or that, poorly on push-ups, that, right? That's how, like, why shouldn't it be that way? That's what I don't get. That's why I've come full circle, bro. We're the fuck. It, this is the military. This isn't yeah. like the fucking civilian HR dude at <laughs> fucking like Walmart and the the greeters. It's like, oh, let's just all get. It. No, I want, I want to be almost like it. And this is what I said. Like, let me let me back this up because I, I I I showed you guys my score a week ago, dude. Out of like thirty five NCOs, I I am the oldest. Well, no, I'm the second oldest. I'm the oldest that runs. Let me put it that way. I'm the oldest who runs, and I finished third. And to me, that I was disappointed. I really was. Like, why am I running a 15, 52 mile after all of this, and everybody else is running like 17 plus, who are like 10 to 12 years younger than me? Like, where's the fucking pride? Like, why are you not taking, because most of these guys are not going to convert. They're not going to reclass. They're not going to become permanent recruiters. They're going to go back to their jobs. And most recruiters, bro, are just like, most of them come from combat arms. So I want my combat arms guys to be the most physically fucking fit dudes in the world. I really do. Like, I don't, I'm not saying that to be like, oh, he's just trying to be fucking, you know, no, I want my guys whose entire purpose in the military is to kill the fucking enemy to be the most physically fit possible. Yep. I don't want them to barely pass the fucking run on the ACFT. I want them to crush it. And I want them to definitely be fucking faster than my 1550. Like that's like, yeah, that's (laughs) 93 points in my age group, but come on 1552 mile, bro. Come on. Right. You're 29. (laughs) Well, like, Dude, when I was 29, I was jogging 13 minutes. Like it wasn't even hard. Like, come on, man. Like that's, I don't know. There's a, there's a big, and I don't know, like, and, all right. Cause I, I really do want to wrap this up, but I want to get maybe, maybe do you think like there's a disconnect in fitness standards overall and the guat because we were so focused on the next deployment that we just did away with a lot of the shit. Like, no, no. So I, I think where the disconnect is, um, so I think most of the GWAP mm-hmm. vets who were who were probably our field grades now, yeah, um, understand how fitness is supposed to be ran. But they're the where the constraint is is how the army has always done fitness in time of memoriam. Right, you're not going to ever prepare a infantry company by doing regular infantry company fitness, which is like, wake up, do your run, do your pushups and sit-ups and then go yeah. up and then start your duty day. What it really comes down to and what I don't think the army has really gotten yet and soft has because they have these assets that allow them to develop training programs is an NCO. I think NCOs get it. They just don't have the NCOs and junior officers get it. They just don't have the time for, you know, three squads worth of privates to write programs or develop programs or even yeah. teach how to do these programs. But what it, what it really comes down to is like, you know, you have to assess and then develop a program for dudes where, you know, one guy may be too muscle bound and has to get uh, a lot more cardio in. Whereas there's one dude where you literally need him to bulk up so he can pull weight on that, 
um, on the deadlift and then also, you know, succeed in the power yeet or whatever. <laughs> and, and, and the other problem is, is it's the, it's been this, it's been the problem is you're training for the test. You're not training for combat. And yep. so like, because the ACFT is well-rounded or supposed to be, and it's supposed to help you train for combat. Um, what's going to end up happening is you're just going to do, you know, one week of training for this power, this ball throw, and then training one week for this, whatever, and then training, you know, and then passing the PT test and not actually having the combat focused strength that you should. And what it really comes down to is like the army needs to really invest in, um, you know, actual no shit fitness trainers that know what they're talking about that can help write programs or develop a battalion fitness program that then can be passed down to companies and then kind of a little bit in terms of modularity, right. When it comes to getting everybody, at least on the same page of like a baseline fitness program, you can do that. And then, you know, we, you go into, you go back into diet and everything else. And the thing that sets soft apart is there's a lot more personal ownership because the leadership is so decentralized. And if you don't perform on your PT test, you're not <laughs> going to be on a fucking team. And then you get yeah. sent on staff and you just can't do that on a line infantry company or whatever. So we're not there. I don't ever think we will be, but like, I think that's kind of the, yeah. you know, the, 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 the right one way. good thing I do think that was coming out of my, my time there a year ago is that, uh, so they, they, they're moving to kind of what you described, right? Like everything is supposed to be like, I think what, what they described is in terms of numbers. Now they can't really pinpoint it at, the battalion level but in terms of numbers they could technically say it was all available at the battalion level but what they're working towards by 2026 is to have at the company level an entire in-house what you said someone mm -hmm. a physical fitness person who can do the program someone who's a chiropractor someone who's a dietitian someone who can write and do all of this stuff for the at the very company level like that's where it's supposed to be like we're right. no longer expanding it out to the battalion like let's reduce it all the way to the minimum which is the company right company level is that's the center of gravity when this stuff comes into play right so they're trying to get to by the year of 2026 i think like every company in the active army is going to have a dietitian a chiropractor a master fucking programmer whatever the fuck you want to call you know the the problem with all that though is you're expecting and and this is a problem in soft too so you're expecting nfl athlete performance for pop le pop warner level prices <laughs> that's you know point. what i mean that you're is like oh we we need to have all these dudes to train these infantrymen in so they could go in and fucking kill this guy super lethally and they're like <laughs> oh yeah but we're gonna pay you we're going to pay you like you would a first lieutenant uh, master dietitian, or we're going to pay you well, like here's the we best would part. a it's going to be part of the, it's going to be a, a 68 series job, E7 right. and above. And then, and then what'll happen, <laughs> it'll happen like everything else. It just gets thrown to the wayside and gathers dust. And then somebody else will crack it up and be like, oh, this doesn't work because we obviously haven't implemented it properly. And then it'll get, you know, reinvigorated and then it'll be some sort of bastardized version of what it used to be. That's what, and so I, I hate, I hate complimenting the Navy SEALs, but that's exactly what they have actually done right. Is they how many books uh, have you written, bro? Uh, is they is they is instead of instead of you know commissioning a dietitian, they just send they just they built enough relationships to where they can send SEALs to NF like not NFL teams, but where they have a connection with dietitians that work have worked with the NFL that work with college teams. And yeah. so then like, Hey man, go to this, go to the Xenos program in Raleigh, North Carolina, where they also train collegiate athletes and they'll put you on a recovery program and a rehabilitation program for your knee that you got, you know, well, shot up. I, I, so let me, uh, let, let me just play devil's advocate for a second. Let me push back. But don't you think like, even if you apply the NFL level, I guess, regimen but you apply it to the the layman it will still work right a hundred percent the problem though is uh if if that's the case then all you're doing is telling your privates not to eat shitty food but you well, but well like, we already i can i right. can i can spend two more hours on the fucking defect <laughs> but you've got to <laughs> but you you have to monitor them right like, or the it, fucking food court where you offer nothing but shit Right. But the, the thing that you do is like, you're hiring a dietitian, you're hiring a fitness trainer. So you can, so you can 
write programs either specifically for soldiers or yeah. for units. And the real problem is, is like these guys, after they do their time in the army are going to go work for college teams. or they are going to go work yeah. for NFL teams? So like the well, real I mean, problem the, the, is the, the real is, fix is to just stop pretending that the food court is anything but an option to the defect and just well, and it's, fix diet. Like that's it. Just fuck. Like, you know what? You, here's where I would, here's where I would base it off of bro. Why don't you just base it off of what you offer overseas? Like right overseas is everything and it's healthy it's a hundred every country i've been in from kabul in afghanistan to fucking jordan at, at fucking uh jtc to 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 kuwait to iraq every defect overseas is a hundred percent healthy oh yeah and and it's you know <laughs> and it's and it's most finite distillation it really just it really comes down to um you know self-control like realistically if you're a private uh, and you want to perform well, then not eating at the food court and either making your own food or going to a defect that does have good chow is what is what's key. Um, but like, I mean, here we are with dudes performing like dog shit on PT tests and everything else. And the reason why is, you know, it's there's a, there's obviously a myriad of reasons. Um, well, and if the THS is one tiny heart right. syndrome, right? So. It is, <laughs> and it's. It, I mean, again, it, it. Some of it is is leadership, and then some of it is is um. Yeah. You know, our assets or lack thereof or whatever. Um, I still think it comes back to culture, man. Because, like, I mean, I get it. I've been in twenty years, but when I when I came in, there was an expectation. Like you, you're good. Well, to, I, you're gonna do this. And I'm not active anymore. I'm a guard guy, and I still yeah. I still take pride in the fact that I would consider myself a professional. I think it's and, more so you have, and to. I refuse. And well, the funny part is I don't get paid to be fit anymore. Right. Right. Like, yeah. You just army on you know you duty, have to, right. The army on active duty paid me to be fit. Now that I'm a yep. part-time employee, like I got to pay my own way to not be a shit bag. And so like, I'm not saying that it's hard because it's, it's always difficult to manage it when you've got a real job and a family. But like at the end of the day, um, if you, if you don't want to fail a PT test, you'll you'll do what you need to do when it comes to time management. So it's that's how it works. Yeah, no, that's that's very accurate. And um, but that's what I go back to. It's like I I almost think, and I know I got a bad rep early on, but I almost think like I mean I know from a fact the reserves guard you can speak different to, but maybe you can speak different more because you know you were kind of specialized with the SF version, but those dudes in the fucking reserves or whatever, like they have real jobs outside of their time when they show up once a month. Yep. You know what I mean? And like, especially where I came from before I came out and did this, but dude, I was in a one-star command where most of these people were like full-time logisticians, like in the real civilian world, like they worked for multinational corporations where that this is what they did. And they just mm -hmm. kind of came and did it on the fucking reserve side, but the fitness level sucked. Yep. I'm not gonna lie, like that that didn't and, and that was my biggest frustration when we come and show up at formation. I'm standing in front of him, like, look, what the fuck? Dude? Like just three times a week. That's all I'm asking. Go run. What like why is this why is this so hard? Just go do something. And then but you know, it is what it is. But no, I, I honestly feel like physical fitness is the one thing. Uh, but it's even to this day, like when when I was drill sergeant, it's different. But now it's like, look, there's two things in this world especially in the army world that no one can help you with that's physical fitness. And that's shooting your weapon for qualification. You need to do those on your own. Yeah. Okay? All right. And, and if you don't take the time and put the effort in, you're going to, you're, you're constantly going to be at the wrong side of this thing. But anyway. Oh yeah. I agree. He agrees. Did you catch that? <laughs> I agree. hundred right. percent. Yeah. All right, man, let's get out of here. Okay. Look, I, I appreciate all the time you've given me tonight. It, it was more than brother. I expected. Um, there, there's probably a thousand things I didn't get to, but you know, that's why we do another episode in seven years from now, whatever. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> but no, so look, this is red devil. He's snake eater 36 on Twitter. Uh, murder cult is the, 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 the fit, right. The yep. high end fashion, which I've managed to tag Gucci. No, I didn't. I, I tagged Louis Vuitton in with my, <laughs> no, was it Louis? Yeah. My sunglasses that my wife got me for the fucking wedding. Very nice. <laughs> so Louis Vuitton, Murder Cult. Um, yeah. So where can they find Murder Cult? Is there is there a location? Yes, it's uh M V R D E R C V L T. So Murder Cult instead of use, it's V's. There you go. Yep. It's and we're great. also on Twitter as well. And we're Murder Cult on Twitter. Yeah. Who runs that? Is that you or Brink? 
it's both of us. I think I probably say Brink is 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 more as more often on it than I am. Um, I yeah, he he runs the Twitter and the Instagram. Okay, good. Because I, I mean, I I was gonna try and reach out to him to get him out here on this, but I know he's got real job issues to do, so I'd rather right. he just worry about that. Um, Fair and plus, enough. he's been on here before. It's it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. That I actually had him on here when he still drank. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. So you know, if you if if anybody out there wants to go back and listen to the Brink of Ill podcast for me before he became like I don't know ten million days sober. Right it's out there, right? But that's fine. I got him beat, bro. He's like seventy some weeks sober, and I'm like two hundred and six days of two a day straight. So <laughs> it's cool. I got it. it's good. All right, all right. So this is Red Devil Snake Eater thirty six on Twitter, and like I said, please follow this man because he does throw a lot of things out there. If you don't get in the Twitter, um, you should. But a lot of things from from weapons to just just basic stuff that you need to know. It's like he's he, it's not it's not an account that you shouldn't follow. If you're ever come to Twitter, definitely account you should follow, learn a lot, uh, ask questions. He's very responsive. He's a very nice, he's a very nice young man, right? <laughs> very nice guy. <laughs> All right. Um, and I can say he's a young man because he's younger than me. So that works. He's a very nice guy. Uh, uh you're approaching 30 K bro. You're about to get verified. As I know it's, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd be down for that if they could do if they could uh, if, if they, they could verify, verify me when I was anonymous. an anonymous account that would be fucking hilarious but that that's where I'd we are down. on twitter all right so that's red devil snake eater 36 bro thanks a lot man appreciate it thanks man brother appreciate